Hello guys and welcome back to the Rosrate podcast. Um, I've been a little bit quiet. I haven't released anything for a little while, maybe about a month. Um, it's hard to put out episodes every week. You've got to really stay on top of things and book stuff in advance, which I'm not always great at. But I have uh, to make up for that as a thank you for you guys being so patient. I have a really, really great lineup lineup over the next month. So hopefully I have some really awesome episodes to put out for you guys. Uh, starting with today, today I'm joined by Ben Wybrow. Uh, aka the judo physio he is a physio funnily enough uh, and today we're going to be talking about injuries uh, recovery and injury prevention uh, ben is a uh, he's, he's been doing some work with the uk brazilian jiu-jitsu association and injuries is such a big part of i'm sure all sports but uh, definitely with brazilian jiu-jitsu it's something that we all suffer with to varying degrees at some point during our our training and um, it's really annoying. Nobody likes getting injured and nobody likes the long waits that come with the recovering from getting injured. So today we're going to talk about the basic principles that Ben uses to uh, recover and also to prevent injuries and then answer some of the questions that I got. I have never got so many questions on, you know, I put these Facebook posts out asking for what questions you guys have for the guests and when I mentioned that I had a physio coming on I had the most number of replies I've ever had so it's obviously a subject that is very close to all of our hearts um, because people just hate injuries so hopefully there's some good information in this episode and hopefully it can help you guys and, and, and either help you recover from something that you're dealing with or to prevent some injuries in the future anyway guys I hope you enjoy it check it out so uh firstly Thank yeah. you very much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I was on your website. Oh, were you? Yeah, oh, yeah okay. and I was uh, doing a bit of research. Thank you. And uh, it said that you were a physio and for, uh, well, one of the things it said you were, you were a music physio. Yeah. Which is literally a combination of words that I've never heard <laughs> ever in my life before. So tell me a little bit about that. What, right. What's the deal? I wouldn't think really a good title for it, but basically I like to work with musicians. Yeah. So you you know, there'll be some physios that like to specialize in certain joints, for example. And obviously I like to work with martial artists as we're going to come on to over the next however long. Uh, the other interest is with musicians. Um, specifically, I write at the moment for uh, the Bass Guitar magazine for the UK providing advice on basically how to reduce your risk of getting hurt and obviously at the moment managing things when you do get hurt. Is that is that like a big, a legitimate risk? Does that happen a lot? For them, you'd be surprised. Really? Yeah. What sort of stuff do bass guitar... So, so kind of you sp almost specialising in... Ba you, do you play... I play bass and flamenco guitar. Okay. Yeah. So um, what sort of injuries do bass players pick up? So all theirs are non-traumatic. Yeah. So it's because they're not... Re rep like, re like repetitive strain injuries. Yeah, essentially. They're overuse kind of injuries. Yeah. Mostly upper body Um basically spine and arms essentially really yeah um and it's basically through their sudden increase in playing demand or they've got the stress and strain of playing um however many nights a week don't do much exercise yeah all of that combined hardly much at home if they're on tour a lot overloads the system injuries can happen um and it's quite it's more frequent in musicians than the average um Joe. Really? Yeah. That's yeah. It's just I guess that there's lots of things out there, lots of industries of elite performers that aren't sportsmen yeah. that are still having to use their body in some capacity, yeah. and anyone who's operating sort of at the top of any sort of field yeah. is going to be doing a lot of something. And yeah. if you do a lot of something, then that that can cause problems, imbalances, and overuse injuries and stuff like that. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. So the basically we're now trying to treat musicians or professional musicians as athletes. Yeah. Um, if I say that sports medicine's got loads of people interested in it and loads of papers and research and all that, music has very little. Mm. There's got one journal for it in the entire world. Sports mm. medicine's got tens to hundreds probably going on. Um, hardly anyone's interested in musicians at the moment. There's a few of us. Um, but like with martial artists, you know, it's not a lot of... You don't see physios coming out of immediate school and going, oh, I want to go and work for the... BJJ, for example, go and work for um, Flow Grappling or the UFC. They want to go and work for Man United or um, for the European Tour in golf yeah. people or um, England hockey or something like that. You know, it's it's a open market and I thought I'd go for it. Well, you, you kind of think that actually there's there's quite a lot of money in because there isn't that much money in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Judo and stuff like that compared to other industries within the same field so other yeah. sports uh, uh um you know different types of sports and football and rugby and yeah. stuff like that but you'd think that there are some 
like really there's quite a lot of money in the entertainment industry and the music industry and stuff like that wouldn't you potentially yeah it's thing with sport is people associate physio with sport they don't associate well that's the thing unless you're top like you know traveling the world metallica um you know someone who's got lots of dollar to throw essentially and i've spoken to the guy who travels with them with metallica yeah yeah really yeah and he just treats them he so so, so that was gonna be when it, when you said metallica that was gonna be my question does metallica have a full-time physio when they tour really yeah. well, he's a, what they call a physical therapist in the states yeah um but he and he's just for them those wow. four not for anyone else like, like not for any of the crew or stuff no i i spoke to him i said did you treat everyone on the top he's like no just those four guys wow. and basically Unless a major issue comes up, um, he will give him a bit of a rub down before the show, and that's it. Yeah. Like I don't know what he does for the remaining three hours of the day. He goes and rocks the fuck out, wow. probably. He goes <laughs> to the gym with him, but like. Because because I I went and saw Metallica uh, a couple of months ago, right? And uh, they're super high energy performances, yeah. and uh, they they're like doing dates back to back, like all rock rock bands do yeah. you think like the physical toll on it must be ridiculous yeah. um so that's uh, you just never you would never ever think that yeah. metallica has a physio that travels <laughs> with them and and kind of sorts out any injuries that they have well that's apparently they do um yeah. some other ones apparently acdc do and maybe guns and roses do as well wow. and i'm sure um like your rihanna's or your madonna's whoever do as well um but below that it's hard essentially yeah. to get because uh, money essentially yeah yeah of course um unless you've got people like me or there's an association called the British Association Performing Arts Medicine. Okay. And people of the country who play um, any musical instrument and if they're professional or amateur and want help regarding and it's an issue that's stopping them playing or impacting them, they can self-refer to it and they get free assessment um, wherever they are. Mm. Essentially, they just go, most of them in London, but there's a place in Birmingham and around other countries as well. And uh, after that, they have to pay because um, it's essentially private. Um, but beyond that, like you said, unless you're up there, you know, making top dollar, you have, you know, you've got to fork out for it. Sure. You know, because it's not going to be, obviously, you've got to pay for someone to go with you all yeah, the time. Yeah. Fly them, feed them, and obviously pay them to do their job. Yeah. And many people obviously wouldn't be able or willing to do that. Of course. But that's the goal. It's such an interesting, you just like, it makes complete sense, but you don't, uh, you wouldn't actually think about it until you start yeah. thinking about it, you know? If we had this conversation again in 10 years time. that Yeah, well, that's what was going to, kind of what I was going to ask you is, do you think this is going to completely change and within, you know, 10, 20 years, actually it's going to be obvious. Yeah, of course, all musicians have physios because they have a physical demand yeah. on their body and they need yeah. to be looked after. Yeah. I mean, the problem is, if you look at the people like the Stones now, yeah, they're still going, you know, it's... Previously, used to be once you hit a certain age, most musicians would stop or yeah. retire on what they had. But now, people just want to keep going, and they're getting older. And so, I think as time goes on, they'll need. As people get older, they're going to want to look after their body a little bit better yeah. from the get go. That's very interesting. Or at least more, just try and prevent it. Or sure. Or reduce the risk of issues yeah. happening in the first. It place. makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, so, now we got we got <laughs> we got that. I, I just I, I thought it was so interesting. I wanted to talk to you about it, but. Um, of course, you are the judo physio. Yes, sir. That is your that is your name, Twitter, right? Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> website. The judo physio. <laughs> uh, so you do judo? Yes, sir. Um, so kind of how did you get into that? And then how did, from that, did you get into doing physio stuff? So I started judo at the age of about six. Okay. Um, like many kids around the late 90s, I loved the WWF at the time, or the WWE as it is now. And my parents saw me liking that and thought, hmm, what can he do that replicates that? And the next village along, there was judo. So every Wednesday night, I would go down and do judo up to the age of 18, all the way through school. Then um, around the time of 15-ish, we were debating what careers, but I settled on physio and then got into uni at Hearts, which is up the road from here, yeah. I believe. Um, and then from that, I couldn't do judo over those three years because basically you have to be on placement a lot of the time and judo was on a Monday afternoon. And yeah. you have lectures a lot of the time on Monday sure. afternoon. So I had to drop it. Completed the degree, went into work, started doing judo on the side and I was at the top of my brown. So you have to go and compete for your black belt in judo. And there's two ways. You either do a, basically have to win uh, 10 fights against other brown belts in a competition um, or other black belts, that is. Or you can go to a grading where you have to do a similar thing, but if you win two fights, they'll then put you in a lineup. Yeah. Where essentially you have to fight three in a row. If you win all three, you get your black belt. Yeah. And was 
training up for this, was hitting the gym for the first time for you, for ever, basically. And uh, I thought I was doing quite well. And I thought, you know what, all these people that are going to turn up are just kind of similar to me. They probably haven't done it for a while. I don't have much competition experience. I sh- I've done some competition before. I should be fine. I go in there, I get bounced. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even, I think I got a s- half point and that was about it. It ended badly. And then the same thing happened again a few months later. I'm thinking, I came out um, and was, uh, came home and thought, well, you know, what else can I do? Because I've got this degree and this job, which I like. And I was kind of, knew I didn't want to go into the whole football, rugby, hockey kind of area. But I thought, well, you know what? I do like judo and I do like being a physio. Let's see if I can combine them together. Sure. And down the, um, into Cambridge for me, it was at the time it was Anglia Ruskin University judo, which was fairly high up in the uni teams for judo. And they are the, well, they were the center of excellence for the Eastern area. And I simply emailed them and said, look, would you like a physio to come and help your squad? And I got an email back the following day saying, yes, can you come later in the week? And it snowballed from there, essentially. And then um, over the time was then, I think it was just over a year ago now, I finally got my black belt. And uh, at the same time, I've been physio for them and it's changed the name to Combatant, as you'll see on the website now. Mm. Um, and then about a year after with them, I started with Tsunami MMA who have produced a variety of different MMA fighters. They do BJJ and Muay Thai and other stuff as well. And then for about the past year, I was in contact with the UK BJJA. And then there was some changing of management and things were going on behind the scenes. And eventually I spoke to Mike, who's now in charge. Yeah. Um, and that was, ooh, I want to say, September time of last year. And he basically said, look, we like what you do. Um, you know, would you be willing to do what you do for the organization? And I said, yeah. And obviously right now on this, anyone who's a member can see, I think I've done four videos so far mm. that people can watch um, what we've done, load management, injuries, what research says, uh, rest and recovery. And what was the other one? I just did, oh, sleep. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's all just kind of kept going since. And that's the story, basically. That's pretty cool. And, you know, this is one of the things that I say to people because obviously like injuries is such a massive part of sport. But yeah. I think when it comes to grappling sports, judo and MMA and jujitsu and stuff like that, it, it seems like it's almost a completely unavoidable, like it's you're going to get injured at some point. Yeah. And do, do you think that's the case? Do you think that it is inevitable and that there's no actual way? Because it's not like, say, let's say you're doing something like you're a sprinter. Mm. If you train really intelligently and you prepare yourself really, really well, because it's such a limited variables that are going to happen whilst you're running, yeah. you may go your entire career without ever having a proper injury. But when you're doing something like judo, doing something like jujitsu, where it's so chaotic at times, it's so scrambly at times, and you're against another person who's trying to move you and throw you and stuff like that, yeah. injuries are inevitable. It's your, when we say, you know, when you look at the Olympic levels of injuries across the areas, yes, judo has got high amounts in the competition compared to other ones. Now, is it inevitable? There could be an odd person around the country who has done judo or some form of grappling all their life and never got, they might have got a bruise, but never got major hurt. Great. Congrats. I I, I, str- <laughs> I believe that if that person exists, then they're basically like Bruce Willis in uh, Unbreakable. <laughs> like, like, they, you know, it's just uh, I couldn't imagine anyone who can who doesn't pick up an injury. I I've I've yet to meet anyone who's done some form of grappling long enough who hasn't got some form of decent injury. That's not let them know about it for more than a week. Yeah. There'll be some people who, a decent amount of people who will go through their training and never get something major like, a, let's say, a cartilage tear or a, a they won't need cancer. surgery, yeah, yeah, or anything, you know, anything major time off, um, which is great. But there, I'd be surprised if there's not anyone in the country or around the world who hasn't had some form of bash at any point that's kind of given them pain for more than a few days. Mm. Let's say, um, is it inevitable? You know, people could be really careful and do their best but i think nothing is inevitable mm. um you you can't prevent injury yeah. you can reduce the risk sure and we'll go for all that later on but i'd say to answer your question is it inevitable i can't say 100 percent yes but it's 
it's my thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. I think <laughs> anyone who does uh, any sort of martial art can probably answer that question yourself <laughs> from the amount of time that they've been injured. But, but I think, you know, is there, there are people who don't get injured as much for sure. And yeah. there's some people who get injured a hell of a lot. Yeah. Like, what is that? Right. So if you, um, if you were to look at into research, they call it a chronic rehabber. Yeah. So someone yeah, who gets yeah. hurt, tries to get back to sport okay. and then goes down again and it kind of bounces along for injuries all the time. Mm. Why? They could, the whole factor of reasons, I mean, do they have the tissue capacity and strength to handle what they want them to be able to do underlying? If they don't, they're more susceptible to get hurt. They could be training with people who are very clumsy and not you know, very harsh on them, let's say, and they're not prepared for that either. Um, they could be in an environment where they're being having demands put, stressed on them. Um, people are, you know, could be genetically more at risk of injury. Mm. Um, through certain issues, There's a, you can't, there is no one. It's all, with all these things, there's a collection of reasons why. Um, is it, can we pick out those people in advance? Hard to say. You'd... <laughs> Maybe in the general population for general pain, we're slowly getting there, but for sports, we're years off. Yet. Sure. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's definitely, there are definitely some people who just seem to be injured all the time. And, you know, f for some, it's because they train too much, they train too mm. hard, or they're too tight, or they're trying to ask their body of too many things. Mm. But for other people, it just seems that, like that person, he's always injured, <laughs> you know? Or she. Or she. <laughs> yeah, no. Wait, d you know what? Actually, women seem to have way less injuries than guys do. Is that like a legit thing? <sighs> Depends who you're comparing and what you do. I mean, I, I feel like women are better at recovering than the men are. I don't know if there's any studies on that, mm, but it's I'm purely on my own anecdotal <laughs> experience. We've but also got the fact that less women do grappling. Generally. Yeah, hundred percent. So you're, you're picking from a smaller field, but all yeah. of the women that I know who uh, who do roll, mm. they tend to not have as many injuries. Mm as many of i don't know if that's like a tightness thing because they're a little bit more flexible or uh, uh something to do with their capacity to recover i don't know it might be you know it might be just that type of I, i'm gonna i'm probably get told off for gen you know being generalizing or for this but there is a certain you know women that do bjj are usually pretty fit yeah generally um you don't find many un you know unfit or um lazy ladies that do G bjj they want to do it either to keep fit or to for their own yeah i, I don't think there's any lazy people who women who do bjj yeah. because it's too hard for women <laughs> who train bjj like that's it's a really really hard thing to do you're going to yeah. get beaten up because most people are going to be bigger and stronger yeah. and you've got to be pretty mentally tough yeah so you well, can't be too lazy exactly well men um there's a there's a fair four more of us that do it anyway and we can you know i've seen a fair few guys come into the gym over time who really ain't looking like they've done hardly any exercise and then start rolling around with guys mm. at your level or my level and it's or people a lot harder or rougher on them than um, someone who's nicer would be and it yeah it could be that maybe that's why um like we said maybe they just don't have the underlying capacity to handle what they want them to do mm. um is there any major research on it <laughs> not yet yeah um it's for you know we should all recover roughly the same rate. Mm. Um, you know, theoretically, ladies have more going on inside them, which should, if anything, make them increased risk. Sure. Um, but why is that you and I see... Uh, you're right. I see less women do, who roll getting hurt compared to men as well. But again, is that just due to the numbers compared to yeah. who don't do it? Or is there other factors we can't really say yet? Um, but I'd agree with you on that, that from what I've seen so far as well, it's just going to have to be... You know, visual is what we see that yeah. generally less women seem to get it than men. Mm. That's not saying the women don't get injured. But no, just, of course. Just, just, just in general. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, th I think one of the really important things, you know, I've, had a, I've a, had a very decent share of injuries in my time. <laughs> um, and whenever I'm seeing anyone about those injuries and kind of my advice to anyone who's injured who is going to get that looked at by physios or by osteos or whatever yeah. is... If you do something extreme like judo, like MMA, like grappling, then you can't really go to a normal physio and expect to be given advice that's really going to help. Like they're going to treat you like a normal person mm. and you're not really a normal person. Yeah. You know, if you're if you're doing something extreme, your your, your GP isn't going to understand what your Tuesday nights look like. <laughs> so I always advise people to go and find people who 
do the martial art that you're doing or do something similar yeah. um, and they have a little bit more of an understanding so I go to a friend of mine who is a black belt and is a physio mm. and he knows and he's not going to say oh put some ice in it and take eight weeks off because he knows that I'm not going to do that <laughs> he's going to be a bit more realistic oh you know maybe play off your back for a couple of weeks and maybe don't go too hard and you know stuff like that so I think it's so important to have someone um, you know you know having a physio for the judo team being mm -hmm. someone who's a judo black belt not yeah. just being a physio who's decided they want to work with some judo guys yeah it, it, it also makes the athlete feel better as mm. well because they've got someone who knows what they're talking about um you know they can uh, they can say well let's add a guy two days ago i said he said i said what happened he goes well i was doing taitoshi then he also had me backwards and my ankles inverted i don't know what he means mm. go say that to most other people they'll go what yeah. They're like, oh, you got pulled backwards and you were trying to follow him forwards and then you got pulled backwards and your foot got stuck and rolled in, right? Um, so, it, yes. And it, You're talking the same language. Yeah. And they, I know where they're coming from in their attitudes because I know the demands of sport and obviously we can tailor their rehab and it, it does make it a lot easier. The problem is, like we said, there's hardly anyone out there. Mm. You know, there'll be, I say for the major cities, there's probably one maybe around somewhere there is a maybe there's a few around london I think. yeah there's quite a few um but out further you get away from the biggest bigger cities unless it's going to be but yeah. it's definitely beneficial for even if they don't say do a grappling sport but maybe they did another martial art it would still be better than that than not knowing or it, even if they do any sport to like a any kind of extreme sport if yeah. they go li if they lift weights they do crossfit or something like that they understand the demands of an athlete are so different to the demands of someone who doesn't do any sport whatsoever that you just yeah. or they play football on a saturday for an hour once yeah. a week and it's just completely different right yeah working in sport has it also challenges you a lot more than if you just work in the nhs um because you have you know if you're an nhs physio rarely you're going to see someone who's had an injury an hour ago yeah yeah you know, or a day ago you're going to see people people will be on the waiting list but the urgence we see people about two to three weeks to be honest so while in sport you can see people almost there and then or mm. basically there and then um and it just gives you a better idea of understanding why this person's come in this situation what they're experiencing not just from themselves but they'll have coach pressures they'll have pressures maybe from sponsors competitions it might be their way of life and earning mm. um, and all of that can play a part too and i think it's uh, when you treat the general population we will still get people from the general population who do sport who come into the nhs yeah because um, most people who do sport unless they're in a professional situation or can afford it privately will have to come through us and it makes dealing with those kind of people a lot easier um not just from a understanding of the long-term rehab but also in the short term they see someone who doesn't really know what they're you know their situation it could confuse the situation anymore make them more concerned it's that's a problem get exacerbated mm. but if they see someone who knows what they're going you know talking about understands the situation and can say look this is okay you'll still be able to do xyz if you can just not do like you said so roll on your back for example mm. or um you know don't do any backwards don't get thrown backwards in judo mm. let's say and then they can still do it. Still keep that keeps them happy. Keeps them able to do a sport. Keeps everyone else involved happy as well. It helps the pain. Yeah. Okay. If you can keep this happy, it'll keep your pain happy as well. Mm. If you can concern this, then the pain will get more concerned too. Sure. Yeah. So uh, you know, kind of with that in mind, it's obviously so useful to have a physio who's also someone who does you know is a judo black belt. Mm. And do you, do you roll at all? Do you know jiu jitsu? So I do roll in the MMA uh, class. Okay. Nice. Um, so I. I would be very much a white belt. Yeah. <laughs> I can't say I'm, uh, you know, anyone who's blue belt or above would hand it to me quite happily. Sure. Um, but I can do the basics okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and you understand what's going on with yeah. judo. Yeah. So kind of, it's quite useful for someone uh, with that experience and then combined with the knowledge of being a physio mm. uh, to put resources out there like you're doing through the UK BGJ. Yeah. So uh, if you don't mind, should we go through some of the topics that you're... Go for it. So, uh, kind of you listed them out four different videos that you've done it was the first one was was load bearing or so load management so so what what is that so load management is essentially that is the if it comes to reducing your risk of injuries that's probably a number one okay load management load is essentially the amount of stress and strain we put for our body on a day-to-day -day basis so for bjj athletes would be rolling um, the gym um, a job if they have one other stuff as well with injuries yes you have your traumas well, let's say someone, you know, gets commuted really hard or they twist their knee and there's trauma. But there's a lot of cases where that doesn't happen. OK. And the pain just starts coming on over time for no apparent reason. 
And what usually happens is there's, they're going along quite happily and there's, when there's a sudden increase in, in demand through the tissues, wherever it is, and it, sometimes it's not one thing, sometimes it can be a collection of things over time, that asks your tissue to do a lot more than it's ready for, then that basically increases your injury risk. And if the tissue capacity can't handle what you ask it to do, the tissue will then kick off and let you know about it, essentially. And it might not come on straight away. Sometimes it can be as late as four weeks afterwards that the uh, tissue lets you know about it and you mm. can then get hurt. And then obviously you get pains, you do less over time. The premise of load management is if we can avoid those spikes and stop that happening, then we can reduce the injury risk. Um, if people want to actually go and look at research, there's an open access paper came out early 2016 in the British Journal of Sports Medicine by a guy called Tim Gabbett, uh, and I think it's called the um, Training Injury Paradox. Um, and it's about eight pages, and it sums it all up quite nicely. Um, so you can go and get that online for free, I think. And essentially, if you can, can basically stop someone spiking, and essentially spike, at the moment we're saying is more than 10% of your normal. Um, and the best way they measure it at the moment is by saying, how long have you done something for? So you know, 90 minute rolling session, hour at the gym, something like that. And how hard do you find it? Um, so there's something called the rated proceed of exertion. Zero is nothing. 10 is the hardest thing you've ever done. Want to stop immediately. And people will score themselves out of those, combine it with the time. They usually get numbers. Um, and it's on the video on the B UK BJJ thing. I think of um, maybe a few other places as well. If you basically collate it over time and they might do other things if you're in a professional area like heart rate and take blood levels and other things like that um, and basically what they want to stop is the 10% spike if you, can, if you want someone wants to increase their training demand that's fine you just got to do it slowly sure um, there are fancy lots of fancy apps and gadgets out there you can just use a pen and paper for judo they've actually got there is one out at the moment called the athlete analyzer um and that's actually based out in Sweden, but anyone can get it around the world. It's basically a load management tool app that we use at Combatant. Oh. Um, and we just monitor it. And if someone's coming up and it's looking like they're doing an increased amount of um, training, let's say, and they're going to spike, we say, have a rest tomorrow. Or just do this lighter. Or, you know, go to the gym, but just do, um, you know, cardio instead of heavy weights. I mean, you can stop them drastically increasing that score, essentially. Um, or any other factors that you're measuring too, you can reduce the risk of injury over time. Sure. So, so what the, you know, through that, it makes sense that um, if you're suddenly, you know, it's kind of the whole uh, people aren't training, then they decide that they've got a fight coming up in X amount of weeks, uh, eight weeks out or something, yeah. and then suddenly they go from two gym sessions a week to twenty gym <laughs> sessions a week, yeah. and uh, I find that that's a, I, I don't know what your experience with the MMA team is that you work with. Mm. I've done a bit of work with MMA fighters in the past. Some of them are all right, but some of them are also terrible uh, <laughs> in that they are the most inconsistent people that, I, that, that I've ever trained. And this is whether I've been training them in just for grappling or whether I've been training them back when we had uh, the, the, the gym and they were doing their strength and conditioning stuff. Mm. There's no real, the whole eight weeks out, that like the training camp mentality is super mma based and not really uh jiu-jitsu doesn't really have that no? people are no, no. pretty much ready because they can uh, often people compete a lot more often yeah. so um they don't really have that and because you know if you're competing in mma you have to do a lot more so it does make sense that you have a more focused uh, periodized section but the thing is is people stop doing any training unless it's eight weeks out from a fight, yeah, you know? Yeah. So you'll, you'll barely see someone and then they'll pop in and they'll say, I've got a fight in eight weeks time. They're like 15 kilos overweight. They're completely mm. out of shape. They've got no cardio. And then they start doing three sessions a day and then of course they're going to get injured. Yeah. You know, so, so it makes sense that would, would it just mean that you would try to, um, if you did want it to, let's say you wanted to increase your capacity by 50% yeah. instead of doing it, immediately you would work it up in 10% increments slowly until you got to that 50% more. Spot on. So whatever you're aiming for, um, have you know, say you're going from training twice a week and say you want to build up to training, I don't know, twice a day. Basically, gradually increase it to, I would say to that person, basically you need to by add a, add a session a week, essentially, and go from there. Um, that'd be safe enough. And it just needs to be slow and build over the weeks and months as they build up to it sure. it needs to take time because your body is slow to adapt you know strength changes take what six eight weeks yeah to get there minimum sometimes it takes longer so 
if someone can avoid suddenly doing a lot more, that it basically will reduce their injury risk anyway. But if you can build it up gradually, it helps even more. The other thing is, what they find is when people really gunning for it, who have built themselves up gradually and are working really hard, their level of injury risk isn't much higher than anyone doing less than them. Mm. So you can get up there. That's not a problem. And if you keep going there, if anything, actually, the more strength capacity you have, the lower your injury risk is going to be. Okay, if you can get there, great. It's just the getting there. That's sure. the problem, okay. essentially. Um, and then, like you said about when people have competitions or other fights coming up, then they'll kind of get there. Um, they maybe don't get hurt. They get through the fight or the competition. They do okay, but then they stop. Yeah. or they do a lot less and then let's say something suddenly happens where they want to go and compete next Sunday um, and they've done nothing for have a period of time and then they're suddenly going to do a lot again and then that's when it can happen Yeah. Um, if they want to go and compete that's fine that's their choice in the, the day and they just got to understand there's a risk there's no guarantee but the joke, running joke is basically the guy wrote the paper uh, when he, after he wrote it he showed it to his dad and the dad just went well that's common sense mm. And it's taken all this time for someone to just to go, oh, yeah, well, now this, this is common sense. And now we just need to do it, mm. essentially, and just monitor people. Um, you know, if you play for Chelsea or Man United, you've got a variety of members of staff who are on their computers day in, day out, seeing what the scores are going at, and making sure it all looks OK. Most people won't have that, of course. You, you can buy some apps, but you can also just put it on your phone. Sure. And just do it that way and just see. And if it's roughly... As long as it's, if you want to increase it, as long as your score is roughly under ten percent, fine. Over over how much time? Oh, so if you're going up for a week, let's say, so let's so say so ten percent a week. Yeah, yeah, that's the max they're aiming for. That could change over time, and that's a general term, um, and that's basically come out of um, Australian rules, football, and athletics, and soccer. Um, not, there's no specific number for martial arts at all yet, and it may be that five, ten years time, we say, well, actually for Judo, let's say, it should be only 5%. Well, mm -hmm. it could be 20%. Um, but at the moment, the, the safe bet everyone's hedging at is about kind of 10% increases. Sure. And then you'd imagine that it would have the same sort of thing if you've had time off after an injury. Correct. That if you go, um, someone tells you to take eight weeks off to let your shoulder heal up. <laughs> and then, so on the Monday, oh, I've had my eight weeks off, I'm going to start training again. And you've done zero sessions for the last eight weeks, and then you're going to go back to five sessions a week, you're probably going to hurt yourself. So that is the case of our person who repeatedly gets hurt. Yeah, basically get injured, rest fine, great, don't do anything if you want to suddenly come back. So it's not necessarily because they're coming back too quick or coming back and re injuring the same thing. Mm. It's because they're going from a zero work you know, zero work rate to a whatever they used to be work yeah. rate or even more because, yeah. you know, they've been hungry to get back yeah. on the mat for eight weeks. Correct. Because all that time, all those eight, let's say eight weeks, that tissue capacity is going to burn down. Yeah. You know, the chain, you can get strength. You can also lose strength. Um, the simple phrase is use it or lose it. Well, if you're losing it, unless you get, you want to, if you want to get back there, you've got to start using it again. Yeah. Um, and that, that is the main, the biggest um, crux for injury reducing risk is load management. They've had weekend conferences de debated to this one issue, um, which can be quite boring. Um, and there's other things as well. But if you can get that down, that is the probably, I'd say so far, the most important thing people can do to reduce their injury risk. If they can mm. monitor that and stop or reduce their risk of suddenly spiking over the 10% than normal, there shouldn't, injury risk shouldn't, um, shouldn't be any more increased than normal. So you can use sort of what would be the main uh, variables that you'd be monitoring for that 10%? So would it be, you know, the perceived rate of exertion or uh, the heart rate variability or a combination of those things? Unless you're in a professional sport environment, most people won't have access to the heart rate measures or the bloods or anything like that. Yeah. And actually research shows the most uh, subjectively good ones are the you basically take the amount of time you've done something whatever it is the role or the gym and you times it by the RPE's number okay you get a score you add score for that day week and they generally at the moment are saying basically take your average over those four or six weeks then for a certain week if you want to increase it that's fine just make sure that your increase is not beyond 10% of what you did over that average mm. I'd say most people listening won't have access to a heart rate variable monitor or blood, anything like that. That is the easiest thing they can do. Just how long you did your session for or gym or work or whatever it was that's made your body feel tired or yeah. worked out. Score it out of 10. So zero, no effort at all. 10, hardest thing you've ever done. You'll work it out over time. And then basically collect all those numbers over the days, week, 
get a score for your week, get a score over a month, let's say, and then best thing to do is start creating an average after about four weeks and you can change that average every time you add on a week. Mm. So it's your average of your previous four weeks, essentially. Mm. And then the week that's coming up, if you see, let's say you've had to do loads of rolling on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and other stuff, and then it's looking like you're going to do a lot more than you normally do, take, if you can, have an easier day on Thursday or yeah. Friday. Or roll for half the amount of time or roll half as, you know, half yeah. as hard. Yeah. yeah, essentially. If you can get that is the, for the time being, the number one thing that we can advise for reducing risk of injury. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, yeah, that is really interesting. That's really good advice as well, I think. And it's, just, you know, kind of that adage is, you know, train ho- train smart, not hard. Yeah. But then people don't actually, they just say that. Like, I'm trying, you know, I like to train smart. <laughs> but actually, what, what are you even doing? Are you, yeah. you know, how are you training smart? And that is a way for you to train smart if you want to increase the capacity that you're working in yeah. and, and decrease the risk of you getting injured, then being smart is tracking how hard you're working and making yeah. sure that you don't make sudden jumps and increasing it. Yeah. Uh, okay, what's the next one? Right, after that, there. after that, I'd say strength. Okay. And capacity. Uh, I know you're a good advocate of strength and conditioning. Yes. Um, many people in uh, martial arts aren't. Yes, they are. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, um, I don't know why, to be honest with you, and you might have more reason why than I know. Um, Probably just because it's hard and some people don't want to have to do the hard work. Yeah. We know for a fact, strength training combined with some stability stuff will reduce your risk of injury too um, of any joint essentially more stronger your shoulders are the more they're going to be able to tolerate you want to do during your judo or jiu-jitsu or whatever more leg strength you got again easier it's going to be to produce the force to do all the throws or other things you want to do less strength and capacity you have from doing that then more basically the higher risk it is of that those tissues not being able to handle what you want them to do um it's quite simple, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Um, now, we'll come on to the debate of stretching in a little bit, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but it's the... I think people can understand why. It's really the just getting them to do it. That's the hard bit. And with all of this injury risk reduction stuff, it's the implementation and the buy-in, so to sure. speak. Um, we said so, you're, about, so you're saying, like, stretching's good? Uh, stretching has a role, but we'll come on to that. Okay. Um you know, you said you like Metallica. Yeah. Is that Megadeth? Uh, yeah, a little bit, yeah. So Megadeth have a cool song called Peace Sells, but who's buying? Sure. So I like to think of that with all this injury reduction stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah. It sounds great, but who's actually going to do it in sure. the long term? Yeah. Um, essentially, if someone could do some form of upper and lower body strengthening once or twice a week, it will reduce their risk of injury. And it's been shown in an abundant amount of research mm. covering a variety of different sports. But, that, but that's assuming that you do that strength work properly yeah because the the absolute worst thing and i always say this is um people getting injured doing the strength training for their sport where they were doing the strength training to not get injured you know it's Mm -hmm. just like ridiculous you know if you 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 take someone like a power lifter where their sport is lifting weights Mm -hmm. and power lifters have a really high rate of injury they tear pecs they tear quads Mm -hmm. they tear hamstrings they do all of this stuff um and that's unavoidable to a certain degree obviously you can do stuff we're talking about this earlier you know are injuries inevitable at high level sports potentially you can say yeah to a degree but um so so they can that's okay but if you're doing um strength training let's say that you're doing deadlift squat bench to get stronger for judo or Mm. jiu-jitsu and you injure yourself doing that then you've kind of now you're not going to be able to do jiu-jitsu mm. and now you're not going to be able to do any more strength training. Mm. So it completely defeats the point of, of doing it. So it's kind of being smart in your um, in your approach to the strength training so you don't injure yourself doing that, which defeats the whole point in the first yeah. place. Yeah, and again, we come back to the load management of that. Someone jumps straight into strength training and tries to deadlift 120 kilos and they have deadlifted before, but not end well. You know, if they start, even if they just start with, I don't know, 50K, most people I think have lift a 50K barbell off the floor yeah. reasonably well. Um, so, similar thing. Yes, you need to have your technique down, and it only really takes someone who knows how to do it or is educated, like PT, or anything else, just say, look, this is how you deadlift, this is how you squat, this is how you want to do everything, whatever else that you want to do is. And there's machines in the gym as well that yeah. you can use, they're fairly self explanatory. Um, you don't need a you know a, a weekend course in strength and conditioning to do learn how to use the gym machines. Um, if someone again is sensible using them and 
are doing it all okay, they build up their weight over time, it will reduce their injury risk, okay? Um, <laughs> like I said, the heart of it is just getting martial arts athletes to do it. Yeah. I'm quite fortunate in the judo, the, our, um, the coach, um, he is very for it and he makes sure that they do it as part every week and over time we've implemented all the load management and strength and, and other stuff and, and their injuries rates going going down. Mm. Again, just an anecdote. Yeah. But, um, contrary, MMA gym, not really a coach per se in charge. So they kind of do what they want and sometimes they do some S&C, sometimes they don't and the their injury rates have just been kind of going up and down over time never really changing that much. Plus, all those in the gym is fluctuates as well. Mm. Um, so strength is the second thing. To go with that, you'd also say stability. So stability means kind of balance. More important for your things like you know, football, rugby, all that jazz. Sure. But you need to have some decent amount of stability for judo or grappling in general. And again, when they combine things like strength training with stability things, and I'm not talking standing on a BOSU ball on one leg. I'm, you know, grappling on one leg, for example, just trying to push a person over, fat, throw, and fat, throw and catch a ball um, on one leg. Multiple hops and jumping change directions, so things like plyometrics, good as well. Combine all that to change your balance will reduce your injury risk too. How, how does that do that? Does that just mean that when your balance gets tested in a grappling scenario, it's kind of more prepared to deal with how the body's going to move essentially so for the premise of obviously strength training you're building the tissue capacity of the muscles fairly straightforward or the tendons for the balance stuff it's like you said it's essentially getting the body used to a variety of different um impulses and stimulations all at once so it can handle it when the pressure comes so if you were to at the end stage acl rehab for example um i would be putting uh, let's, get, let's say get them on one leg trying to to grip, grap, grapple fight or grip fight at the same time maybe shouting out random words at them or things the other guys have to do to challenge different things at the same time because when you're in competition you're not only trying to fight you've then got a screaming crowd mm. a coach trying to shout at you maybe you're having a difficult relationship with a ref um, and all other thoughts come into your head as well we can get all that down um, yeah reduce the risk too we said about stretching so if you were to look into research right now, stretching is getting a bit of a bashing. Mm. Um, okay, I'm on board with this. Yeah, go on. Yeah? Oh, no, yes. You've got me. you got okay. me. Okay. So <laughs> stretching, most of it, again, has been done in your kind of athletic, soccer, um, hockey, rugby kind of areas. Yeah. And essentially, when people, when they've just done stretching on its own, I mean, I'm talking static stretching here, so, you know, sit on the floor, touch your toes kind of stuff, doesn't really change risk at all of injury. Now, for grappling... I definitely say you need it for performance or for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, and if someone's got you in some form of, uh, I don't know, whether it be for a hamstring stretch submission or um, something that really tests your tissue capacity. So um, I'd say an ankle twist mm. as well. Yes, if you can do that repeatedly, your nerves are going to get used to the stretch more, so they'll be handled more of it. So you'll be able to tolerate that more before you want to tap. Sure. And I'm not going to say there is no role for it because I guess apart from performance, it does help recovery a bit. And when you combine it as part of a warm up, it seems to be effective too. Um, but it is definitely not the be all and end all that we're all brought up thinking to do um, when you're at school or in other areas as well. This is static stretching. Yes. Yeah. Well, kind of they've said that static stretching is basically no good. And I, uh, there's research that it weakens the work capacity of the muscles, right? That again, that qu that's in question, but it depends when you do it. Sure, like if you, if you were to do static stretching before you lift weights, yeah. that you that you I don't know whether it increases the risk of injury, but that it, you aren't able to generate as much force through those muscles. Yeah, it's something you have to do it fairly. The exercise really to be swiftly after you do okay. stretch, the effect will wear off pretty quickly. Okay, um, and that is again depends on who you talk to. Sure, in the sciencey world, um, but that is definitely out there. Um, yeah, but like like you said, it's not the you know, it's, you're not stretching at the end of a session to or before to reduce your risk of injury doing it. It's not really going to affect that much. It might help a tad if you combine it with all the other things we've talked about already, but it's not going to make a massive effect. Yeah, it'll help your performance definitely because you need to be flexible to do whatever you want to be able to sure, do. Sure, yeah. And that's, I would never not advocate it for any martial art. 
I mm. say, yeah, keep stretching. Just understand that it will help your performance and it might help a bit, but it's not the not going to massively reduce your risk of injury. Sure. So what what uh, so if static stretching doesn't do that, is there another type of stretching that does? At the moment, we don't know. Okay. So potentially, for you've heard dynamic stretching. Yeah. Potentially, and we know it helps performance, uh, and people get better gains and ability when they do some dynamic stretching before they do some form of exercise. Yeah. Um, and it might be doing. There might be research at the moment that's being done, but there's nothing out there yet. Sure. So if you again, if we met in five, ten years' time, I could well say, yeah, it does help, mm. or no, it makes no difference. But for the moment, I simply can't say yet. Yeah. So, I, uh, what would you have? You know, if you were running a judo session, or mm. you're running a jiu-jitsu session, or MMA session, what would you have people do as a warm up at the beginning of class? To, 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 because really, why do you do a warm up? You do a warm up hypothetically to reduce the risk of injury, right? Yeah. Yeah. And warm ups have been found to be <laughs> here's the oh, another one I think. So again, for those kind of um, footballs, your athletics, the multiple types of warm, dynamic warm-ups so a mix of um, some strength stuff some balance some plyometrics some stretching does help reduce injury risk yeah okay there is one for upper limb and that is done in handball players and that was again a mix of stretching and cuff strengthening and other stability stuff as well which reduced the risk of injury um, but there isn't we don't know at the moment what is best sure. for warm-ups so if I was in charge I would go into a mix of things so uh, Warm up the buds, some cardio, just run around the mat for a couple of minutes. Everyone does that in most MMA sessions or at martial arts sessions. And then uh, some balance stuff. So at Competent, for example, we usually do hopping on single leg. Uh, first of all, forwards, you swap legs, and then you're backwards as well. Um, you, you could also do um, they do cartwheels for upper body. Um, for strength stuff, you do press-ups. We do sometimes do one-arm wrestling where you basically get in a press-up position, one arm on, mm. other arm you got pulled with or passed and over for your shoulder stability. Um, squat jumps, forwards, back, sideways. Um, single leg squat jumps, same thing. Or um, Any other kind of body weight. Um, and if they want to make it a bit heavier, we could do body, uh, have someone on top and do squats sure. on your shoulders. Yeah. Um, sometimes do handstand walks. Um, basically so doing, doing this strength stuff before you do the rolling or judo or whatever is is good to yeah definitely yeah. it's just it's just me body weight it's not we're not talking you know max one yeah rep, well, for most people it won't be one rep max yeah. um they should be able to do you know, eight to ten squats fairly comfortably mm. um and i think if you can combine all those things bit of cardio bit of strength bit of uh, stability maybe some stretching if you want to yeah it, it'll help yeah. Okay. There is no best. Yeah, at the moment, yeah, there's all sorts of articles saying plyometrics is the best thing to reduce your injury risk in a warm up, or um, standing on one leg balance work, eyes closed is the best thing. No, no one knows at mm. the moment. Again, time will tell, but at the moment, it looks like when they combine everything, it's most effective. When they take out separate parts and just do them on their own, they're less effective. Sure. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. What's the next one? So we had load management, uh, strength. Stability, I have them in S's, so I've got five S's, so the load management is sensible. Uh, strength, stability, stress. Okay. Yeah, so I think that's going to be the next video for the BJJA. Yeah. We know that when you've got in higher levels of stress, depression, anxiety, anything else going on in life, that negative output will then basically increase your risk of injury. Really? Um, yeah. Um, and also, when you can, there's a variety of papers out there that show that if you can implement things that reduce it in athletes so and it's covers a variety of topics so psychology is quite um variable in how yeah, they do their yeah, research yeah. so to say um works too so if they can get implement things that reduce the athlete's levels of stress or, or whatever else depression anxiety reduces a uh, injury risk down the line um on the flip side of course if you have those things it increases your risk of injury and persistent pain as well so even if you let's say you get hurt You've got persistent stress going on, it delays your healing. It's quite well known. Um, That's because of cortisol levels. Something to do with cortisol. I can't remember the exact ins and outs of the physiology sure. uh, behind it, but yes, there's something definitely to do with the cortisol and how it interacts with your nervous system. Um, or yeah, it's a depression, anxiety, kind of similar effect, but different um, hormones. Sure. It's flip side, low levels of stress or increased levels of what we call happiness increases your rate of healing. Really? Speed up, yeah, speed up. So, so you know, someone picks up a injury and they can't train and they're super depressed about it. That's going to make it long. It's going to mean that it's going to take longer for them to recover. Yeah. So you're not only got the healing, 
then you've got the pain part of it as well. So from the pain perspective, essentially, when I try to explain pain to people, essentially, if I was to cut my wrist right now, the way I explain the nervous system is you've got a, your brain, you've got your spinal cord, and the nerves we all know, like the train tracks that run out down your arms and legs and go to different parts. And if I was, the other part we don't know is um, the gazillions of either little security guards or if people have uh, got young kids or of that age, um, minions from Despicable Me. Yeah. And imagine you've got gazillions of those around your body and they're always on the lookout for change. Let's say I've just cut my wrist and those little guys will notice there's a change. They send that, send that information up my train tracks of big nerves, spinal cord to brain. Brain taints the information and then there's a variety of different parts, things like your past experience, what else has gone on in life at the time, um, who um, else is influencing you, who you're talking to, um, what it thinks is going on and basically it decides if, if it doesn't like it, if it thinks it's a threat to you, it'll give you a pain response back out so you then protect it, cover it up. Mm. Now, stress in the short term is good, okay, for pain. Um, you've heard about soldiers getting shot in the battlefield but carrying on. Yes. Um, essentially, the the brain goes, well, yes, this is hurt, but it's more important that we get home before getting killed by uh, whoever, okay? So it basically ignores, shuts off that um, response and just gets you there. Once they get back and that's all gone, it will cause hits. So it's not, so like uh, when someone gets shot and they're able to continue doing stuff, it's not because they're a tough son of a bitch, it's because <laughs> their body's got, it, but their, ba their mind has basically prioritised them doing what they were trying Correct. to do over having a pain response. Correct. It's basically a priority cue in your brain. Sure. Um, and the short term it's great. So, you know, if you fall over in the street, twist your ankle, but there's a bus coming at you, you move. Yes. Okay, you will move. Um, if there's not, um, you're lying there and you're like holding on to it and so sure, on. Yeah. The uh, another analogy to think of at home, you stub your toe, really hurts. Yeah, it hurts like a bitch. <laughs> I did it earlier today. I like run I ran this chair over my foot about two hours ago. Fucking killed. Exactly. <laughs> but if you're uh who do you support? Uh who do I support? Do you football team, do you have a football I don't team? I don't support football teams. Uh, that's all right. No. Let's say okay, let's say um one of your guys is fighting at the champs. Okay, yeah. Uh and you're you're coaching them, really like you're doing tomorrow. Yeah. And you get really excited and something happened, you're really in the zone, you stub your toe and whatever, but your brain will ignore that because you're too happy thinking about that. Sure. And the short term stress is great. But in the long term, essentially, if you have any of those negative outputs, what that will essentially do is keep that system heightened. So what should happen over time is as I continue to move my wrist, um, the little guys realize that, oh, it's healing, it's getting better. We'll send less information up. I get less of a pain response. Plus, you've got all the other factors like what you can see. Um, you can see the scab healing. Everything else is going to plan. Mm. That still happens. But if you've got all those negative things going on, essentially that um, circuit, so to speak, just keeps going so like if you uh, thinking about your injury and it's you're thinking negatively mm -hmm. it's not gonna the, the inflammation is gonna stay there Inflama so the tissue will heal yeah the nerve what we call sensitivity um will stick oh so it just hurts still still hurts um things there's certain things out there you might have heard called crps or chronic regional pain syndrome um you ever heard of phantom limb pain yes so amputees lose their leg they can still feel it the tissue's not there, you know, that's, yeah. you know, there's no, they can't be in pain if there's, well, the tissue can't be giving them pain if there's no tissue to be there, so to speak. Yeah. But they're still getting pain. The system, the circuits are still going, even if the tissue's not there. Yeah. Um, paper cuts hurt like hell. Yeah. Right. You've done hardly any tissue damage, yet it bloody hurts, essentially. Again, pain is very rarely actually, and we'll come on to this when we discuss other injuries, very rarely actually descriptive of a certain pathology. Certain issues it is, but there's many things out there that we could suffer from that the pain is not in accordance with the tissue health, if that sure, makes sense. Yeah. And so you combine, like I said, that could all heal up and it could all look fine. Um, but if that system's still ongoing then, and you've got all those other influences, that can keep it going long after everything's healed. Wow. Um, so that's why I said stress, essentially. Um, because, yes, okay, it not only will keep things going longer than um they should but will also um reduce the risk of issues happening as well you said about if you're thinking about your injuries people will um say a lot of the time i've heard it, it's kind of okay during the day there's certain things i do but when i lie down at night it really hurts for some mm. reason what you haven't got lying in lying down at night is a distraction all you've yeah. got to think about is whatever's going on as a risk for example or whatever else and nothing else during the day, you've got light, sounds, whatever you're doing for your job or sport, that can all take your mind off it. One of the 
the things we try to do with people who've got persistent pain is to get them to do a certain activity they want to be able to do, but with a distraction. Whether that's, I say, music, someone else, a pet, doesn't mind what it is. If you can take the focus off this and on something else, again, can mess around with it, mess around with the nervous system, but essentially can help reduce the pain output. Call it that. Yeah, it, that's so interesting because I guess people always associate damage and pain yeah. to be like absolutely connected correct and that the, you only have pain if there's damage and therefore if you have pain you are hurt you know you 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 know pe pe hurt and pain are basically yeah. the same thing but they're not the same thing yeah. being hurt is actually having something structurally physiologically yeah. wrong whereas the pain is just sort of the the brain's response to that yeah so there's you know it goes both ways so I said, you know, paper cut, hardly any damage. Yeah, it really hurts. doesn't really equate with what should hurt. Stub toe, same thing. Flip side, does a stroke hurt? Most people who had a stroke will say they don't really have pain. Sure. They'll lose function in something, but they won't really... Yeah, there's a lot of tissue damage there, potentially, but they won't really be complaining of pain. Um, there's quite severe issues that we can have that don't hurt, theoretically. They come with other problems, yeah. obviously. But, again, the, the tissue damage and pain uh, relationship is doesn't really hold up at all. I'll come on to this now. I thought I might get there later, but you know about MRI scans. Yes. Yeah. So um, I've, had, I've had enough of them. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the best um, illustrations of this, um, there was a collection of studies that had been done, one with over a thousand people, and they MRI scanned the low backs of all these people and basically found that as your age went up, um, your they had all these copper findings Oh, so disc bulges, protrusions, um, facet joint degeneration, disc degeneration, uh, spondylolisthesis, where one of your vertebrae goes forwards. All these, lots, quite a lot of findings in many people who had no pain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's, again, that's why we don't equate MRI findings that commonly with pain a lot of the time. We only really do MRIs if we're considering surgery because it's essentially to tell the surgeon, can you fix that? Yeah. Essentially. Um, otherwise, doesn't MRI tell you what is wrong? A lot of the time, no, because MRI, if you've had a trauma, yes, okay, it can do. Um, so let's say um, someone's grabbed your arm and really yanked it really hard and you felt a pop and a snap. Yeah. Um, and then you go and have your, um, and it kind of keeps giving, you know, pop, maybe popping out and you go and have your MRI arthrogram and you get a, you've got a, a slap tear, which is uh, your, your labrum around your shoulder. I had a slap, you had a slap tear a couple of years ago. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of matches. Yeah. And a lot of people, including athletes, when there isn't a trauma, so to speak, and let's say they have some back pain that's just been going on for a little while, they decide, I've had this for four weeks, I can access my guy, he can send me off for a scan, and it comes back with a, I don't know, let's say L23 disc bulge. That does not tell you that actually that happened at the time, mm. how long it's been there for, if that's even the level of pain, um, was even, you know, when it started, there's... For example, if I showed you a picture of a rusty gate right now, you couldn't tell me how well it worked. Yeah. You would say that looks a bit rusty. Um, I've got a selection of photos on my phone that I like to show patients to say, um, you know, we've done all these things. These are some quite nasty looking photos from whether it's osteoarthritic changes or other things. These people have no pain. Um, I've seen people who I show them the x-ray and they go, God, that looks terrible. And I turn around and say, but, yeah, but he's had no pain. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, uh, w but would you then still consider that that person to be healthy if they have if they have an injury with no symptom mm. are they healthier than someone with like symptoms and no injury <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean uh healthier like uh, i guess just you know in a better condition you know because that's what you're kind of looking that's what you want right you want to be in yeah. good condition it's with your you know, like it, it, if it doesn't hurt does it matter <laughs> yeah essentially um, there's, you know, we get people come to us and say, I've got this, it looks a bit funny, but it doesn't hurt. And we say, carry on. Um, people say about clicky nicks and clicky knees, for example. I'm sure we've all been to school with someone that can click their hand. Yeah. Yeah. They're not causing their hand, they're not breaking their hand at all. They don't got any arthritis or anything like that. It's not a problem. A click 99.5% of the time is just air being released from something. People click and crack all over the place. That's fine. Um, these, and the, the other thing is, the relationship in the long term let's say yeah you had a you had your MRI scan it showed a that L23 disc bulge doesn't guarantee that it's going to be a problem down the line either mm. um, if you were to compare those who do go on to go have problems and those who 
don't, there's not much difference between those on the scan who have the scan findings and those that don't. Um, that's why we generally just save it for the if there's going to need to be some form of invasive intervention. Um, so that so in our trust, for example, we do that if for low backs, for example, we do it if um, they weren't getting better over time and had leg symptoms. Um, so whether that be um, pain primarily or weakness or some altered sensations. If they had some worsening neurological symptoms, so um, for example, they were losing strength or feeling down their leg and it was getting worse. Or if we were concerned with there was any sinister pathology, cancer, for example. Yeah. If we're happy none of those things are occurring, then essentially you don't, there is no criteria for an MRI scan, essentially, because sure. otherwise there's no surgical criteria. And the MRI scan would not change our management. Mm. essentially it wouldn't change what we do with you if you were to have an MRI scan and you show you've got that disc bulge it wouldn't change what I do with you if you didn't have it sure so did we go through exactly the same thing is that because you'd be treating the symptoms correct you'd be okay. treating you basically over time it was, you might have seen um, initially um, people try to be very specific with exercises targeting the core balance and the, or the knee alignment and stuff like that. When actually what we do now is basically just challenge the things they struggle with. Sure. So if Ethel can't struggle to pick up a bottle off the floor, we get to do some squats mm. or some deadlifts. If John struggles to reach up, put something on the cut on the shelf, I get him to do some shoulder presses or abduction with his arm. Um, if you can make the rehab basically relevant for the patient, they're a lot more compliant and also leads to the faster changes as well. Mm. That was a very long-winded way of saying that, yes, pain does not represent <laughs> tissue damage. Sure. In certain cases, yes, it does, um, well, as I discussed. Um, but in a lot of situations, especially in people that have persistent pain, um, it doesn't. Yeah, so just going back to sort, sort of some of that crazy stuff you're saying about the kind of stress uh, causing chronic issues that yeah. don't have to be there otherwise. So what is something that someone listening to this could practically do <laughs> so someone <laughs> people are probably listening to this and going like man is my is my knee bad because i'm upset about <laughs> it or something like that or i keep on telling myself i've got bad knees that's why my knees are bad yeah. so what can someone do do they do they just have to stop managing stop trying to work on it uh physiologically and stop trying to work on it emotionally or psych psychologically <laughs> it's obviously everyone's individual so, uh, you know, anything I'm going to say is not going to work for everyone. Um, if they, if someone feels they've got a lot of stress, depression, something else, anxiety going on in life that they need support with, um, we have services for our trust that deal with it. I'm sure pretty much any NHS trust around the country would have support for that. You Essentially, if you're struggling and you're not getting there, you get support. Mm. It's, it's very straightforward. Um, and if they don't work the first time, you try someone else. And there's a variety of things online, a place called Headspace and Mindfulness as well, and other things that can help. And there's many things you can read or look at. There's a vast variety of options for people out there if they want to use it, of course. When it comes to, you said about, um, you know, if someone feels that actually them thinking about it um, is exacerbating it, it's easy for me to just sit here and go, well, don't think about it. Because yeah. that's not going to happen. Yeah. I said about the distraction. If you can essentially challenge the nervous system, so those little guys will be kicking off. But we find is if we can challenge them, what we call poke the bear, essentially, and while with some form of distraction or something else that makes it tolerable, some people like to wear tape, for example, or a brace, or who knows what. Yeah. Just to make it tolerable, and if you can gradually, you know, bit of discomfort's fine, um, and then essentially let it calm down, let it set it down, because it will let you know about it. But if you can gradually, like I said, poke the bear, you'll all being well, you should be able to tolerate more and more over time. Yes, I can't go into people's head and turn off the comp cut on the confidence switch or turn off the worry switch, so to speak. Um, and like I said, it's quite it can be quite individual. So there'll be certain situations where um, certain people, for example, might be certain situations in life that make them stress. They might not have persistent stress, let's say, or depression, but there's certain part of the day whether it's when the boss comes in or where the kids come home from work where life gets a lot more difficult and you know they're not doing anything different than the knee but the knee gets worse let's say so maybe it's just about identifying it and then seeing if, if you can work in a way which helps reduce it if you can't or if you're really struggling obviously a lot of services these days you can just self-refer to physio mm. we can where i am um some places you should have to go for gp um but if you need the help you go get it if you're trying all these things and not getting there yeah, it's really, really interesting. 
Um, shall we go on to the last one, which I imagine going off of S is going to be sleep, right? Yeah, spot on. Yeah. <laughs> you did mention it earlier, but... Uh, so, yeah, so kind of talk about sleep, which is something we've spoken a little bit on, on, on this podcast before, but I want to get your take on it. Sleep. People think, when people, think that when people think about sleep, they think about quantity. So everyone hears about the seven to eight hours. Yeah. Now, what is more important for pain at the moment, we're saying, is quality. Um, just to make sure you get good quality of sleep. Some people out there can sleep four hours and that's enough. It'll be absolutely fine. Some people need their eight. Um, and we can't, from the quantity perspective, struggle to determine who is who. And who's going to, you know, if these people who just get four hours, are they any more, and they're used to it, they can tolerate it, okay, are they really any more likely to get hurt than these eight-hour people? If you suddenly change that amount for the eight-hour people and take it to four, or for the four-hour people take it to two, then that will increase your risk. Yeah. Quality um, is more important, and that would be your, um, you know, getting woken several times a night, um, restless for whatever reason, other things keeping you awake, let's sure. say. And that we find that when that gets disturbed, that will definitely increase people's, again, not only risk of injury at the time, but also the risk of pain persisting sure. down the line. Um, I'm, I'll sit here now and say I'm not a sleep expert. Yeah. Um, and the, again, the, the variety of things you can do to make your sleep better. Um, and sometimes it's just down to situations in life at the time. There may be things that's keeping them awake at work or in life. Um, that's why they're not getting a good quality of sleep, let's say. Um, if someone, again, can identify that and put that, oh, actually, maybe this is why. Maybe this is part of why mm. I'm conscious my pain's persisting or I keep getting you know, these little niggles. They can work on it and adapt it. And again, it's very individual as to why. Um, and with all these things, I've said about the, you know, the stress and the sleep and other things going on in life that can cause pain to persist. It's never ne ever one thing. Yeah. It's always a collection of things sure. that come together. The risk factor on its own is very small. But it's when you pile these things up, that's when the so forth capacity or you know output will cause the pain to get res a go come on or then persist. Mm. So I know you're not a sleep expert and you don't want to kind of commit to <laughs> send too much stuff, but what are some of the things that you'd sort of recommend for uh, just in your personal opinion, kind of increasing the quality of your sleep? I'd say they generally say um, the no bright screens an hour before bed. Um, so, so, okay, I um, I go to sleep on my laptop. Like I will be on my laptop until I put it down and I <laughs> to go to sleep. Now I've always thought that um, the reason that they say that is because it's it, it it's hard for people to get to sleep when that mm. happens. Is that is that why they say it, or is it because that's actually going to affect your sleep? kind of throughout the night because I don't struggle to get to sleep. <laughs> I, can, I can like watch, I can be on my laptop, I can put it down, I can close my eyes and I can be asleep. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that it doesn't affect me or is actually that's meaning that I get a less quality of sleep throughout the eight hours that I'm asleep afterwards? They generally, you the first thing you said, actually they generally say it's difficult you must be, you know, breaking the Used system. So to speak. Yeah. yeah. Oh, who knows what? But again, it doesn't apply to everyone. They generally say, yeah, if you if you've got a, what they call blue light, so I think it's yeah. like tablets or laptops. Or yeah, phones. well, I've got like a, and we've I've spoken about this loads of times. I've got like an app called Flux, so right. it it um to the cycle of the to the sun cycle, ah. it, it turns the blue light off. So by the time that I should be going yeah. to sleep, it's a different color. It's kind of like red. Like my computer screens are at the moment. Ah, that's strange. Well, yeah, my yeah. laptop's got the same similar thing on yeah. the setup. So that's one thing. Um, actually getting to bed at a decent time mm. as well. Um, there was a thing out uh, a few years ago now, which basically said, no matter, even if you go to bed um, at, let's say, eight, but you want to get you want to get up at four, you'll get generally less quality or quantity of sleep compared to someone who goes to bed at eight, but then, or a later time, so 11, but then gets up at, what would eight be hours, about seven, Mm. let's say um so early start times um actually it can affect your quality and quantity of sleep so i say to people if you can try and sleep later if work or other issues stop you try to get to bed earlier it's to be honest with you that's interesting because like everyone's on this uh you know jocko willick mm -hmm. he's like uh he's um he's some former marine guy he's like a big uh he's on joe rogan a few times yeah uh Super badass guy, basically, and he's got this whole 4.30 start thing. 
And, lo- and, and I've spoken to quite a few people now who they wake up at 4, 4.30 in the morning every single day right. to go and attack the day. <laughs> go and attack the day, yeah. yeah. Uh, so actually that's not getting you the, the quality of sleep that you should be getting. They, that's, and again, it's not a vast amount of research, but from what we found so far is that if one, no matter, if even if you try to compensate before, you might, you won't get as much quantity and quality as if you went to bed or got up later, I should say. Mm. So you went to bed, even if you went to bed later, if you got up later, um, understanding is and they've done it i think what kind of athletes was it It was a mix of athletes um i think in their kind of late teens to early 20s um over 100 i think um and they basically found that the ones who did sports where they had to get up earlier um had lower quantity and quality of sleep compared to those who had to get up later even when they tried to compensate in the hours before yeah and i've heard this the opposite way as well which is um if you go to bed super late even if you get eight hours of sleep it's still going to be worse quality mm-hmm. sleep so you know i i i have the um i was talking to sebastian brosh we were talking yeah. quite a lot about uh sleep because he wears this heart rate uh variability thing 24 hours a day does jujitsu in it he competed in the tournament mm. the day before wearing the ring it's like this big fat ring but he just puts tape over it and competes in it never takes it off so he's always monitoring everything and basically saying that uh he goes to bed at 10 o'clock i think or might even i think it was 10 o'clock and he does 10 till 6 i guess um so he wouldn't come and train in one of my evening classes because he'd get home too late uh it just doesn't work it's not realistic for people who do need to train late and you know i don't get home till 10 10 30 and then i gotta eat and all of that stuff so it's just completely unrealistic even when i'm trying to bring my hours forward a little bit uh but i guess there's an optimal time to sleep he said i think it's between i think he said between 10 and 2 are like the most important hours for you to get the sleep so you go to bed before that and wait you know yeah Yeah. i i'd Again, it's a lot of unknowns with sleep. We know that if you have significantly reduced quality than normal or quantity quantity as well, then it will increase your risk of A, injury, and B, persistent pain. Um, but the exact like, is still being worked out, so to speak. And I guess that's probably the best advice I could give so far mm. is just try to say if, you, if you've, happy, you've got a happy level of sleep that you've got, and you feel that you're getting significant amount of refreshment every night um, to try to stick with it. Essentially, yeah. And try not to have make any vast sudden reductions in it. If you want, if you want to sleep more, great. Um, and things like, you know, if you're changing environment suddenly or other things come into life which could affect your sleep, just be aware that that could affect your risk of injury and also pain down the line. Sure. And is the quality of sleep stuff like acute or quite chronic as well? So if you have one bad night's sleep, is that going to significantly increase your injury risk for the following day? People can adapt. So it's if anything, it's more within a short term of week than okay. we're finding. Like if you haven't been, I haven't been sleeping well this week, it's like, okay, well, be careful with your training, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, in your, um, what the other thing people can do, and you can't really have this in the professional teams, that what they will do is, they'll, as well as asking their RP and um amount of time they've done something they'll also ask them how well do you feel today yeah. how much sleep have you had how you know all the things like that um which you can't really score per se um but i would say yeah if someone's significantly struggled with quality of sleep over a few you know days to week mm. that they just Might take, take, take it easy, easy. yeah because yeah. your recovery is not going to recover as well either yeah um which kind of what i put with sleep and simply saying that if you essentially train and then train again before you feel sufficiently refreshed. You're asking your tissues that are in a fatigue state to then start doing more than they're ready for again. Yeah. Um, so many people are used to, when it comes to training and uh, recovery, the graph that goes up, um, it's called the compensation and all that jazz. Basically, you, you train, your tissues fatigue, and then they will compensate to what you ask them to do. And if you train again at that point, you then are supposed to get gains. Mm. Again, being challenged at this moment um, because most of that study was done in animals. Um, but the flip side of that is basically where you train, but then you train again or do something of a similar intensity while you're still fatigued. And essentially, if you hit, keep hitting that at that point, not only will your um, tissue capacity go down, which will increase your risk of injury if you're still asking them to do the same amount of things, yeah. will also reduce your performance as well. So if you combine that stuff with then the things like the stress, the sudden spike in load, um, other things as well going on in life, you then get to something 
where not only do you have an increased risk of not only pain, but other injuries and illnesses and things like that, but also performance starts to drop as well. Um, people used to call it overtraining, but now it's basically given the, given the term of unexplained underperformance syndrome. Mm. We call it that because people used to blame overtraining on training. When actually, as we've discussed already, there's a variety of factors. It's on the stuff around training. Yeah. yeah. That can, it might be the training. Well, yeah, yeah, the load management stuff. Yeah. But it might be a whole other, it's like I said, it's usually a risk, a combination of things. Sure. That then overload it. And the only thing that gets it better is time and mm. rest. You, once you hit that stage where your body's just continuously going down in performance and capacity level, the only way you get back is just you rest and recover and then start gradually increasing it again. There's no pill, there's mm. no machine, there's no surgery or anything like that. It's simply, this has happened, you need to take your time to get over it. Yeah. Um, cause and that time's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. If someone gets there long enough, it could be weeks, months. Really? Could it, could it, if it gets bad enough, you know, if they just keep going, um, the worst outcome is death. Really? Yeah. If you read the papers, um, the essentially it goes. It starts with your whole, you know, injuries and your coughs and colds, and then you have your more extreme immune assist, system issues. If it gets there long enough, and you're just not getting combining all those things. You're not getting the request and recovery, and it just keeps going. Yeah, could could kill people. People can literally like overwork themselves to death. Theoretically, yeah. it would take a lot, and I don't yeah. think I think most, well, pretty much everyone would stop before that point, but. If something was forcing you to keep going, sure, and you just couldn't stop, you know, you've heard about um, people who do the SAS trials mm. and die while they're out there. Mm. Um, you know, it's a similar kind of thing. Essentially, the immune system just can't keep up anymore, sure. um, and all the other systems are just overworked. And eventually, something's got to give, yeah. and the body just says enough. Um, again, very extreme cases. And most it gives, it's an example of like yeah. what a detriment not recovering and not resting properly can yeah. have to your body. It is sleep and recovery is like we said with other things as well. It's just so underutilized or appreciated. Um, it is critical um, to not only yes reduce your risk for injury, but more important than that, help your performance. Mm. If you want to get better, you need to be sufficiently recovered to then go in and perform again. Yeah. I don't, I'm not an SNC coach or a, a performance analysis tool, but I can tell you enough to say, or anyone could know that if you, you know, you're only going to exercise again when you feel ready to do so. Um, I wouldn't, if someone, for example, let's say they don't feel sufficiently recovered after they've been to the gym in the morning and then they've got rolling the evening, um, but they still feel really shattered. I'd say, look, do some flow rolling, do some mm. technique, but you feel shattered. When it comes to the hard stuff, go home. Mm. if you want to um i, don't see I think this is like especially true to uh people who are doing jiu-jitsu or judo and stuff as a hobby mm. like if you're a professional sometimes that that's the sacrifice you make to be a professional and a high level professional yeah. sometimes the sacrifice you make is actually you're going to fuck your body up in the long term <laughs> like yeah. that that's the reality you know yeah. like, like why is the one percent top 1% of people are the top 1% because they're willing to do the shit that no one else is willing to do. Like <laughs> be a fucking badass for 20 years and then be in a wheelchair when they're older. You know, like that is, you look at guys like Ronnie Coleman and stuff like that, mm. like the greatest bodybuilder of all time and double hip surgeries and can't walk and having to relearn how to walk and you know, all of that crazy shit. Like, but if you're, <laughs> if your full-time job is a, uh, is a plasterer yeah. and uh, you're just doing jujitsu as a hobby and then you come in and you thrash yourself because you want to, you know, get hard rolls in every day even when you're half injured, um, be a little bit smarter and come in and yeah. do some flow rolling, something yeah. like that. I'll give you an example. I saw a chap, must be about a month ago now. He was, I think it was a plasterer or painter or decorator, something that involved lots of arm use. Mm. And um, he developed some shoulder pain and was already going to the gym most nights of the week um, and had seen a variety of different, uh, I think, physios or other people as well. And he'd even been to one of our specialists and they said, look, you're, theoretically, you've, you're, you're okay. You know, nothing's majorly torn or ripped. No, there's no surgery because there's nothing to repair, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. And I sat down with him and said, you've done all this stuff. What you're doing was fine. But you just actually, ironically, you're one of rare people I say, you're actually doing a bit too much you know, your body, you've done all this hard work during the day. You've then gone straight to the gym and it's, now you're knowing about it. I said, if anything, I'd advise you on even just two or three days a week 
on days you feel not tired to then do some rehab. But otherwise, okay, so it's a rare case. Most people have to tell them to do the opposite thing. Yeah. But like you gave this prime example. Someone who, um, weekend warrior, for example, they've been in the city all week, um, c- completely drained. Let's say they've had to have late night meetings all the time. That Then they come to training on Friday night or Saturday morning, particularly hard session or particularly difficult people at the session, um, the things can happen, mm. you know. Um, and it sets you up. Your body just hasn't recovered in time. Everything's fatigued. You then, let's say, the instructor, everyone else is fully pumped at the session. The instructor's running. You put them hard for it. And then you're just there in the background, kind of struggling along, sweating buckets. Um, these things can happen. It might not be a pain, but you might be more set up for um, something immune system wise, whether it's coughs and colds or worse. Mm. Um, that could essentially exacerbate the issue. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, what I wanted to ask you is uh, more general stuff for the people that you've worked with. Obviously, you've worked with the judo team and with the mm. MMA guys and the grapplers and stuff like that. Is what is some of the things that you, I guess, what are your core principles when working with these combat sport sports athletes to make sure that they're not getting that they're not injuring themselves? Basically. So aside from we cover those five, um, and that covers most of the things when it comes to reducing risk of injury mm. um and the judo but that that would be for anyone really you yeah know, that's just being pretty yeah. smart but f- specifically for the combat sports yeah. guys the grapplers so i'd be advising them on saying um I mean, if we think of the load for example make it specific to um the sport um i'd be looking at saying for your let's say randori's for judo you're rolling for jiu-jitsu um if they want to increase it up um they do Instead of doing, I think our guys do about two or three randories a week. Um, if coach wants to make them do more, then coach has to gradually, inc- you know, gradually increase it more. Essentially, mm. um, there, you know, people go on about having appropriate training partners, making sure the environment is set up. And again, that's very gen- generic, so to speak. You can say that for pretty much any martial mm. art. Um, if anything, all of those five principles for applies you know the reason it works for everyone is because it doesn't what is work and because that she i don't know what else i would say specifically for our judo guys other than we said you know environment good partners mm. make sure you're going prepared all the other things we've already covered mm. um because i would say that ticks most boxes for sure. most of you um what we do find and it's it's only been done in football so far, but they find that when the coach is especially difficult or demanding and very uh, dictatory, um, it potentially could increase the uh, risk of injuries compared to when they have a more um, sympathetic or is that just because coach. the um, the the the, the harder ass coach is just making them do more work when they potentially yeah, um, and there's only been one paper and it's like I said in football, mm. so again time will tell. Um, but, you know, those would be the kind of things otherwise I'd be saying. I wouldn't be saying anything otherwise technically different. I wouldn't be saying, you know, only do five Osotos a night or sure. only do f- take five Kimuras or something like that. Well, OK, so so if I rephrase that to not what should they be doing, what is it that you see a lot of combat sports athletes doing that they shouldn't be doing? Like, what are some of the big... The not mis- yeah the not S and C to start with yeah okay um, so yeah. you said um, I guess they shouldn't be not doing they S&C. should be doing some S and C yeah definitely um, it needs to you need to have the background um, strength to support it so foundation yeah yeah, yeah. Um, not rolling with people you don't trust yeah if that makes sense or you know don't feel comfortable with. I'm quite notorious in our gym for telling people if they're going too hard sure. on me. Um, making sure that you feel safe. Um, and if you, at the end of the day, if you need to do something, even if it's just drink some water um, to make you feel more comfortable, to able to perform and keep going, do it. Um, one of the worst things I've had, I think it's called Ramadan, where the guys don't yeah, drink or yeah. We have a couple of guys who train over Ramadan, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's fine. That's their choice. We had a one of the um, gyms I was at. The coach said, "Okay, there's a couple of guys doing Ramadan here. 
every, there's about 12, 10, 12 guys on the mat for some sparring. My, as they're not drinking, none of you are either. Oh, what? Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, and that's where my eyes come in. And this is, you know, the coach in charge. And so these are young guys, all of them, pretty much on the mat. And obviously, this is almost kind of a father figure to them. They don't really want to disobey him. And I could just see it not ending well oh. at all. You know, the Ramadan guys are probably used to it. Yeah. They're kind of, they've been doing it every year since however long they've been doing it for. Um, but everyone else, you know, majority of them white guys. Holy and, shit. I know. He's telling people that they've got to do hard training without drinking water. It was about an hour of sparring. And this was in Ramadan's in the summer as well, yes, isn't it? Yeah. And so darkness is what, half nine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I vaguely remember like, yeah, I think it was between like half eight and half nine, something like that. Yeah. They did a, so they, all, I think they did a, an easier session where they did. And then once it got to the harder session, the coach just said, right, as they're not doing it, no one else is drinking either. Damn, that's fucked up. That, yeah, it was very, I was very, that's the worst I've seen yeah. of um, things that people, shouldn't be doing I, I kind of get it it's a nice idea and yeah. you know if you want to if you want to show some solidarity to your to your mate then <laughs> do it but to take that option away from everyone uh without any sort of sympathy is pretty yeah. fucking stupid to be honest with i think you. The, be the better thing would be what you just said if you want to support help support these guys and know what they're going through give it a go don't drink until the session is until it goes dark yeah but don't say to everyone no no one's drinking yeah because this is a summer a quite toasty gym as it is, it's an enclosed environment. Wow. And you could That's madness. Oh, I know. Yeah. So from things of don't do, don't be an idiot, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when it common sense things, if you need to take a rest off, take a rest off. Yeah. You know. Um you said about people gunning for it in the in the sessions. Again, they're if you're asking boys to do, even I say recovery over a day, but recovery sometimes can just be five minutes between a rolling session. Sure. You know, if you need to rest rest mm. it's nothing is complicated yeah. about this yeah it's all fairly common sense <laughs> okay um but as my first boss ever told me sense isn't common sure um, <laughs> especially in martial arts mm. um otherwise than that essentially if you can follow all those things plus all the general things about having a good partner making sure it's all safe etc that's what everything i'd usually say sure um it's a pretty good list to go off of. It is. I mean, there's... Because the other thing is, rolling and um, uh, or randori can be quite unpredictable. Yeah, it is. So I can't, you know, say, oh, only take throws forwards because sure. that's not going to happen. Yeah. Or only do rolling or, you know, start on your side always. It's not going to happen. Mm. Um, I guess that's the best we can say for now. Yeah. Uh, so what I wanted to do is uh, go to some of the questions that I oh, got. Oh, we have questions. Man, I tell you something which says a lot about the sport but i got of all the podcasts i've done i got more responses for questions for you than really? any yeah 100 okay. percent. because everyone's <laughs> fucking injured so uh well, i probably wasn't for me it was probably just because they, they, they just they, they just want diagnosis <laughs> and stuff like that um so this is this is a massive one okay. and uh y you know any advice on strengthening knees or best way to prevent knee injuries uh bad knees seem to be the most common reason for people to have to take time out yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is like so I don't know what it's like in in judo, but in jujitsu, knees are the are the one. Yeah. So actually, when it comes to jitsu and judo injuries, uh, the big f big two I say are shoulders and knees. Yeah. Behind that, you then got uh, backs, yep. fingers, and ankles. Yeah. Um. So for knees, uh, so we covered all the things about reducing risk already. For strengthening, um, you've obviously got your quads on the front, so things like squats and lunges. Um, if that is too much strain, then you can do closed thing chain stuff like seated knee extensions or leg press. With obviously. bands and stuff like bands that? Bands, or yeah. if you're at a gym. Ankle you can, weights yeah, if you want to go really light. Um, or even if you just trap, uh, sit on the edge of the table, for example, and strap a shopping bag around your foot and just go up and down, same thing. Um, but usually, obviously, like I said, the greatest weight and stress you can put for it the more that tissue you can be able to to tolerate over time the more capacity it's going to have hamstrings very important um, people love to stretch their hamstrings um, which bend your knee more importantly to be loaded so you've heard about the acl tears yes yes so the acl is supported by your hamstrings the acl's job is to stop your um, tibia basically being pulled forwards against your knee so acl tears will do that yeah essentially well not that far but just kind of like that and the acl will snap Hamstrings support your ACL. They sure. basically run from your butt sitting bone down to the back of your tib and fib. And their job, yes, is to bend the knee, 
But also part and partial of that is to stop the tibia again doing that. The more strength and capacity you can have in that hamstring, the greater amount of force it's going to be able to tolerate before that ACL to make the effort, essentially. Hamstring can be things like hamstring curls, whether that's sitting or lying prone. Um, you can do, um, ever heard of a Nordic hamstring curl? Um, I've recognised the name, yeah. You go on your knees, someone holds your ankles, and you basically fall forward slowly. Oh, like a, like a uh, glute ham raise. That's, that's the other way. So glute ham raise is a bridge, yeah? Uh, glute ham raise, you... Uh, no, it would be... So you, your legs would be supported and you'd go from the knees and come forward. Okay, so we're, yeah, we're talking yeah, about just giving yeah, different yeah. names. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you have to do it slowly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the highest EMG recording. So you're getting the uh, concentric um, contraction in the hands. Yeah. yeah. You need to concent concentric on the way Oh, and then back up. But then doing the movement up as well. Yeah. yeah, so yeah it's the eccentric, lower, concentric, sure. back up. That's right. Yeah, um, that's right. On top of that, you've got a glute hand raise where you can lie on your front and um, basically bend your knee to about 45 degrees and then just extend it backwards. Sure. Uh, or bridges where you can do a single leg bridge or um, bridge where you have your feet basically on the edge of a chair or a gimbal and then bridge up that way. And if you can do that with reasonable... Like a hip strength. extension. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can do that with slightly bent knees or hit your hamstrings very hard. Um, all those kind of things. Calf, people love to forget about calf and knees. Yeah. Um, the gastro does a small role in bending your knees, so simple calf raise are the best things for that. Um, that's all the muscles the knees do. They basically, knees just a hinge joint, just move forwards and backwards, sure. essentially. Um, so for strength and knee, aside from that, obviously some stability stuff like balance work as well. Um, and we went through all the risk reduction things already for knees. There's nothing specific for knees that, uh, that doesn't encompass all the global things anyway. Ba basically, is like, like work all of the muscles around your knee and your knee isn't going to have as, you know, it's not as likely to get injured. Yeah, those, you said about, you said about the guys who, let's say, have horrendous, look, look, horrendous looking knees on x-ray, but no pain. Sure. These are often the guys who have got, who are still going in the gym or still quite fit and active. Um, not all the case, always the case, but, they've got a decent amount of tissue capacity sure. to take the pressure off. And the, the, the underlying premise is the more tissue capacity you can have around the joint, the less stress then has to go through whatever joint it is. Yeah. Essentially. Okay. That, that makes, makes sense. sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the, uh, someone commented underneath the best way to strengthen or protect knees with uh, meniscal damage and when to resort to surgery. So menisci, there's two types of tears you in uh, you either have acute vertical tears, um, which is usually after a twist, um, or um, you know, someone yanked your knee really hard, let's say, or then you have the what we call degenerative or more horizontal tears, where you're kind of almost a part of like aging, essentially. So the acute vertical tears um, come again. Meniscal tears tears come in different shapes and sizes, but generally those, if they're not getting better with time and rehab and you're under you know 50 or even under 35 for our trust um you get you could get operated if it's not getting better after sure. a few months or if you're getting locking um and what we call mechanical symptoms sometimes you do it a lot sooner mm. especially if you're younger now in the what we call degenerative um or horizontal tears where it's just kind of common with time there's no injury per se um they are the research for that is not good for um, surgery, essentially. If anything, it's it's no better outcomes down the line, two years, than if you didn't have it. Sure. Um, like, you've heard of things called washouts or arthroscopies, maybe, of joints? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, they are scrapping those, or okay. a lot of them, over time. So it used to get done loads in the early 2000s. Um, but now they hardly do them at all in anyone in those kind of situations where they've got some form of age-related changes because it basically just makes it worse. Mm. Long term, it speeds up the need for a knee replacement. Wow. Menis like the acute vertical ones generally do quite well after surgery. If they're not getting better over time with rehab and physio after a few months, they generally do well after surgery. Yeah. Um, but those um, degenerative or horizontal ones are the ones that don't do as well Sure. Um, after surgery. Interesting. Uh, yep. I've heard of placebo. Yeah, oh yeah, 100%. So there's a, a book out that I got last year called Surgery, The Ultimate Placebo. Wow. So essentially, um, <laughs> think about it. When we think of a placebo, we think of a pill. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they've done all these studies. It's quite interesting. One, two pills, white pills, are more effective, two placebo pills, I should say, with nothing in they're them. More effective more than one. one. A <laughs> multicolored or different colors are more effective than white ones. Yeah, ones with like a, a brand printed on them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One's, injections are more effective than pills. Sure. Surgery is more effective than injections or pills. Uh, and essentially, it's all the theater. Have they, have they done testing, uh, placebo tests where they pretend to perform? So Holy shit. So... That meniscal, I said about the cartilage. Is that ethically? Uh, as long as the patient approves for it, yes. Wow. So the patient says either you, they don't know whether obviously it's a, it's a blind. No. Wow. So recent one was for shoulders. Came out uh, early, very early in the year or very end of last year. Yeah. Um, and essentially they, it was across the UK, about hundreds of patients. Um, and there was something called a shoulder decompression. Um, which is basically, I, I don't know how what your shoulder anatomy is like, but it, in the shoulder blade, you've got something called the uh, chromium, uh, which sits kind of under the top, over the top, sorry, of your top of your humerus. Yeah, I've, I've taught, my anatomy is pretty good because uh, I've damaged pretty much everything <laughs> there is to damage. So yeah, I had, a, I had an ACJ tear as well. So in a lot of um, situations, what can happen is the surgeons will go in and decompressions where they basically go into that hole, shave a bit around, release a few things, um, some ligaments and maybe the biceps tendon and then theoretically they say because they've increased the space because um, there's more room for things to move it should look better sure um, you might have heard something called shoulder impingement yes that's the premise so essentially um, through the, that small space where your humeral head meets with your top of your chromium there's got a collection of tendons and nerves in there and if that space is getting irritated and it's not getting better with time or physio or whatever um, they go in there and the premise is they open that space things should have more room space to move it should get better yeah they did the study. There was no difference between the placebo patients and the actual surgery patients wow. in the long term. So, um, you know, they, they they cut the person open, stitch it back up, tell them that they had surgery or what, not tell them, you know, yeah. tell them that they might have, they might not yeah. have. And then a couple of months later, ask them whether they thought they had surgery or not. Yeah. So they've patients. There was no, di there was no difference. Holy shit. Yeah. That can't be like that for all surgeries though. Yeah. For certain surgery, it's different. So um, for more... Um, like I, I had a, I had a um, uh, type two uh, slap tear, mm -hmm. full tear, uh, a, a anterior to posterior, and um, he, my surgeon said that. Uh, obviously, probably surgeons would say that, <laughs> but he said that uh, if you didn't have this reattached, it would never heal. Yeah. So, so certain structures like your labrum or your cartilage, uh, tendons, ligaments um, have poor blood supply. They're called white tissues because they have basically very little blood supply. So they heal very slowly, if at all. Um, so that's why um, ACL tears, once they happen, it's happened. It won't repair itself, so to speak. Um, muscles and skin will heal itself because it's got a great blood supply. Okay. Um, and in your that situation where you needed it for sport mm. and you're quite a young chap and want to do quite a lot with it and there was no what I'll call general age-related changes... Those outcomes are good. Mm. But the wishy-washy ones are those situations where, like the type of the shoulder ones, where there's no tissue damage per se. It's just not, it's just come on, it's just not got better with time. Tried a variety of things, it's just not getting any there, anywhere. I believe it's called the Seesaw Trial. C-E-S-A-W. Um, it's on the BMJ either early this year or end of last year. Um, and like I said, there was no difference. The same has been found for those degenerative meniscal tears. Um, so those knee up or shoulder arthroscopies, where they go in, there's basically, what we're finding is, in these kind of uh, age-related changes, there's no difference um, in the long term whether they have the surgery or don't. Wow. Um, so a lot of these, if you want, someone wants to read the book, it's called Surgery, the Ultimate Placebo, ironically written by a surgeon yeah. in Australia. Um, obviously things like knee replacements, hip replacements, big bulky things um, are very effective i think the hip and knees are the most effective ones yeah. for outcomes in the in the, all the orthopedic surgeons um acl tears for someone who is not planning on returning to sport or major high level activity um can usually go do quite well without mm. getting it repaired um and people go oh what about the osteoarthritis risk well you've got to remember the moment someone's drilled into your knee whether to do whatever your arthritis risk is going to go up because of scar tissue correct yeah. and damage to the joint the joint's got to you know your body will naturally repair itself um but to do that it will if they're drilled into bone let's say uh done anything with it they will it will set extra bone yeah 
And that of course that will reduce your joint space and other things can occur as well, which can then inc- speed up the uh, sure. osteoarthritic changes. So yes, that, that's a long winded way of saying. Um, yeah, no, it's very interesting, really interesting stuff. Um, uh, like the above knee question, but what to start with e- exercise wise when the kneecaps popped out or you prefer less specificity? Um, yeah, so if you dislocated a knee, would you kind of just do the same sort of activities mm-hmm. that yeah, you said? But yeah, but if it is a repeatedly dislocating knee, there might be something structurally wrong yeah, with it. Yeah, so, so um, on a one time knee kneecap dislocation, it should get better with time and rehab, but for those that don't. Um, and it keeps re- re-dislocating, so to I, speak. I've seen, I've seen a uh, knee dislocation in person. Uh-huh. That shit is fucking horrible. Yeah, yeah. Um, if if, if, some, if someone's out there and their knee keeps on dislocating, then I feel for them because that yeah. looks disgusting. Yeah. You, there's basically a surge, surgeons will then get involved that keeps re-dislocating. They don't, don't always, but if someone's struggling with pain, it keeps happening. Um, they can do something called an MPFL reconstruction, I think that means medial patellofemoral ligament. It's one of the ones that holds your kneecap to your thigh bone. Mm. Um, and they might do something also called a lateral release where they go around the outside of your knee um, and just basically release the tissue. Mm. If they see that the outside tissues are more tight than the inside ones because the inside ones have been damaged from the kneecap um, dislocation in the first place. But um, again, that, that hasn't been placebo child yet. Sure. Um, it'd be interesting. It does better against physio on its own. But again, how long it does in long term, we'll see. The lateral release on its own, it gets very variable results. Yeah. But if you've got someone who's getting repeated dislocations um, and they're the appropriate age and setup, they can generally do quite well with an MPFL. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, recovery and preventing sore fingers. So this is an interesting one because this is in Jiu Jitsu, Gi Jiu Jitsu, and in Judo. Judo has yeah, got to be a massive one. Yeah. Judo guys' hands got to be pretty fucked yeah, up. Yeah. I remember sitting in the. Um, so I've been a few times up to Warsaw where the British Judo um, main training center is. Yeah. And just bef- on some of the um, training camp weekends. And um, just the amount of people that come in just to collect tape to fit, do their fingers with wow. hand. Now, fingers are hard. Because yes, as we there's not a lot of muscle around there. No. So it's not like you can really increase the tissue capacity per se. Sure. All it really is is tendons. Everything from about you've got some small muscles that hold your kind of um, sit between each of the bones, but the big mu- movers of the fingers. Are in the forearm. In the forearm. Yeah. All this is for the fingers is tendons. Yeah. You can get them a bit stronger, but it's it's difficult. Um, when they say sore, obviously skin injuries. You can wrap it up if needed. Aside, you know, aside from encouraging as much strength as you can, whether it's with gripping techniques or you can do um, finger extensions, you get elastic band and basically do that yeah. against it. Or there's certain things you can buy um, on Amazon where you can test the strength. Otherwise, it's it's quite hard. To yeah, use people's fingers not to get sore if they do it repeatedly yeah, I enough. Can't, uh, you know, one of, one of the things, uh, and the person who asked would have seen this anyway. But one of the things that I advise people to do is kind of uh, do sand bucket or rice bucket stuff is really really effective for mm. kind of strengthening and rehabbing a lot of lower arm injuries I find personally uh, the biggest thing with 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 fucked up fingers um, I do almost no gi training yeah. whatsoever now so I don't have that problem with my fingers um, anymore I put the gi- I got tricked into training the gi last Saturday and I felt <laughs> I felt it pretty bad but um, is uh, like check the way that you're grabbing onto geese like stop grabbing the gear in a way that's fucking your fingers up. So basically mm-hmm. I just take, I'm going to make a video about this at one point, but I take pistol grips when I do training the gear. I take pistol grips almost exclusively really? instead of uh, pocket grips okay. just because, I, like, you know, if you look at my hands, I've been training jiu-jitsu for 13 years and for the t- first 10 years of that I was training gi every day. Mm. Uh, but my fingers are fine and you'll never ever see me wrap tape around any of my fingers ever. Yeah. Um, and then you look at other people's fingers and they've got like seven knuckles per finger. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you got to think, do you want to be able to write your name when you're 50 years old? And yeah. I'd, I'd, li- I'd like to be able to. I can just about write at the moment. Um, so yeah, Sorry yeah. I couldn't give a better answer for that. It's, no, uh, right. it's, it's, a, t- it's a tough it's one. The fingers a are a tough one. one, yeah. It's kind of one of those... It's almost one of those things, but uh, just try and keep it moving, keep the mobility and strength there. Um, with the new rules and the less stiff judo techniques, like I don't even Morito Sienagi. Yeah, yeah, Morito Sienagi. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, they've got more popular, whereas where there's more stress on the elbow, how can you prevent elbow injuries and how should you treat sore elbows after a hard session of randori? Right. Um, for elbow, let's start with the elbow treatment. Um, immediately after, you can obviously do your ice and heat and all that jazz uh, and make it feel better. You know, better. on this note, um, what do you think of ice? Gives good pain relief for some people. Um, you know, about the whole... Uh, because I've read studies, I still recommend people to ice an injury if they get an injury. Yep. But um, I would. But but in terms of actually helping the recovery, there's like I've seen studies about um, the inflammation response that you're apparently trying to stop when you ice it is actually your body trying to heal this as fast yeah. as possible, and then actually you want to allow the body to naturally inflame and take care of the injury as it would do, and stop yeah. trying to inhibit it from doing its job. I, it's. <laughs> It is a tricky because you've got to have that balancing act between yes, information, but then you've got to have still have function. Because the more if you can keep active, um, have a, even if it's not as active as you would be, then it will help the blood flow and you, sure, you're recovering course, stuff like yeah. that as well. Because um, I think uh, the, the the person that I was watching, mm. it was a book, and I didn't get too deep into it. I kind of read it, and I was like, you know, I'll get back to this at some point. <laughs> but um, it was they don't do any ice whatsoever, okay. and they um, they do like muscle stim, stim stuff. Yeah. So they allow the the injury to happen, and then to keep the blood flow there, they'll have electrodes on, and they'll be stimulating the muscles, um, uh, you know, superficially with, uh, with with electrodes going through it to keep the blood flow and keep the muscles active and stuff like that. Is essentially the same principle with ice that with both of them, you're giving them a sensory distraction. Sure. You're with all those things. So your heat, your massage, your ice, your nips, your whatever. You are essentially messing around with the nervous system. You're putting in a stimulus a lot more than what else is going on that basically we said about distractions when people have got out walking and things like that. It's the same thing. It's a distraction. It takes your mind off it or, you know, that sensation you're getting essentially allows you to tolerate mm. or your, your nervous system to go, well, this is big and strange. Um, and essentially, like I said, message around with it. We used to say that something like the pain gate theory and um, that your sensation you're getting from your ice is more than you're getting from your tissues, but it's all very... We've now realised that's not really the case and there's lots of parts to it. Essentially, the way that ice is working is the same as it is working for his muscle stim. It's something he's doing. But like the muscle stim would be in the, like more chronically to use it, not not in the acute sort of first three days, but uh, in the next couple of weeks mm. to get the muscles working and still getting the blood flow through. But there's just saying basically like, you know, th this is one theory anyway. Yeah. I still tell people that I shit if it hurts, but <laughs> that's what I just do. when they get you taking it. I, that's what I say. Generally, if it, do you, I basically turn to Rafa and say, would you like some ice? Mm. And they'll either say yeah or nay. If they don't, fine. If you don't feel like you need ice, don't take it. Mm. Yes. It will give you pain relief um, and we're still very unsure as it's rolling information. Yeah, and um, the other thing is like, does it actually take away inflammation? Yeah, I th you know, it's gonna need, like I said with many other things, it's going to need years before we really know for certain. Sure. Um, if you don't, you know, I've had people phone us up and say, I've had this injury for three weeks, I'm still icing it. I'd say, why? Mm. You know, your swelling, unless you've done something horrendously bad, your swelling will go down by that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you need it for pain relief, fine, but otherwise... It's not going to do a lot else sure. for you for the yeah. time being. I'll let, I'll let you answer his question about elbows. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, obviously, the, in the short term, they can heat ice. Anything else you want to do to give it nice, make you feel nice at the time. Um, for uh, Beyond that, the principles are the same for how you kind of treat any joint. You want to challenge it and work it in a way that is tolerable for that, whoever's hurt. So um, if they, let's say, bash their olecranon, let's say, on the bottom of their elbow where the triceps goes into and it's sore to do extensions, um, once you've got your pain reasonably under control, I'd be getting them to do some form of loaded extension mm. however it is. Reverse biceps, biceps some work, okay? So, like, to, to, to help you recover from injury, you should be going through the range of motion yeah. that it hurts. The days of us giving out rest yeah like gone. yeah yeah you might have heard of something called the price for acute injuries where it was um protect yeah rest ice compression elevation where yeah. they changed that it's now called police which is protect optimally load which means just use it as able okay ice compress elevate as needed yeah um and so essentially i'd be saying yeah do all those things to make it feel nice but then keep using it as you feel able mm. okay if it's not getting better over several weeks or if you need to see someone sooner, go see someone. Mm. But most tissues, if you can poke the bear, 
gently challenge it mm. and the tissue the nervous sensitivity can go down they can little little minions or security guards around there can realize there's no major damage going on it will get there yeah okay um, that's such an important thing like people it's so natural i think it's instinctive for people to go i've hurt my elbow until it's a hundred percent not going to use the elbow yeah and then if it doesn't use it, you're, <laughs> not, you're never gonna, you know, you're never gonna get that function it back. Stay, really, it stays. It yeah. potentially stay. It could, might not get to hundred percent until you load it. Yeah, essentially, um, that's you know, and that could be applied to the knees or to shoulders or to whatever, essentially, mm. or to fingers. Um, and if you can do that, um, if you want to go and push it around, great. It will make it feel nice at the time. It won't speed anything up at all. Um, same principle. What was the question before the treatment bit? Um, something to do with it was just it was just about the with the difference changing rules there's going to be more of this certain technique and with that it's going to put more stress on the elbow how can you prevent that injury and stuff can't stop people falling onto their elbows unfortunately yeah um in that situation if people are going to be doing more putting more demand through their elbow than normal um it's pretty tough yeah to say i can't really you know Apart from, apart from saying everything we've already said. So like, uh, you know, obviously you said with the knee protecting stuff, build of the muscles around, you do the same with the elbow, yeah. do bicep, tricep, do yeah. forearm stuff and that protect, would be, protect everything around it. Yeah, that would be for your, you know, if someone was doing, having to do lots of um, gi pulls, for example, or pushing away, um, but for falling onto it, it's not a lot you can do to, pre to prevent hurt when someone's repeatedly bashing onto sure. their elbow at all. Yeah. Um, advice on training around neck injuries oh so if you've got neck injuries um i will say uh currently she's either just done it or done it uh, there's a ex-ufc fighter called rosie sexton yes she's an osteopath yeah i'm gonna have rosie on here at some point excellent yeah. she does a, she knows a lot about neck so she's very good for these kind of things um but she uh, what i would say is training around necks same kind of principles do what you can tolerate within a reasonable manner um if it's sore just to rotate, then I wouldn't, you know, just to do this or any, whatever direction it is, I would be hesitant to um, let someone or be confident to let someone roll or do any major competition because you're going to get pushed and pulled around. Yeah. If someone's, if you're standing, someone yanks you forward, you don't have to do that um, or the reverse or any direction. Um, like, with, like with the spine, it's, like we said about the whole scan findings and things mm. and structure, it won't often be a case of um, you've done some major damage and it's going to take X amount of weeks to get better. It will just be the case of use it as you feel tolerable, load it, put, put that there, see how you go. Um, with next, the key things to look out for um, in more in regards to the kind of the blood supply to the brain. So we ask eight questions of. Um, when they've had the neck pain, have you had any double vision, um, problem with speaking or swallowing, um, dizziness, passing out or fainting, any nausea or vomiting, facial numbness or uncontrolled eye movement or any on top side of that, you can also have any uh, major loss of power to any of your limbs, um, struggling with walking, problems with your bladder and bowel control, feelings around your front or back side um, or metallic, I said metallic taste already. Mm. Um, those are the kind of things i say to look watch out for with necks if you start getting additional body changes with necks um the reason we ask those questions for the first eight we call the d's and n's is basically because the blood supply to the brain goes past your neck and those are the kind of things you would get with somebody who has a, st or a stroke or a brain problem from blood supply mm. you get those kind of things um while we ask the kind of blood and bowel stuff the uh, numbness around the front or back side of so the major loss of power down the legs for something where the spinal cord could be getting compressed either at the neck or potentially down in the very low of the spine very rare very very unlikely to happen but it's just something to keep an eye out yeah just being careful yeah and if those things do happen you go to any yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um what well, we've got inflammation dealing with inflammation um so we said about you know uh, the debate of ice yeah I always say, like, let the body heal. So there's a, a big debate about paracetamol and ibuprofen and when sure. you should and shouldn't take certain things. Yeah. So now paracetamol should have the same effect of pain relief as ibuprofen should have, theoretically. Um, and ibuprofen, they, 
from the research again they're saying it could potentially delay your healing and they don't like people taking it more than the first first week or seven ten days yeah after that it starts being ineffective or detrimental to your healing recovery um so apart from keeping the base of this police thing as i said protect it as much as you need to but keep using it ice if you want to compress it if you want to like a um if you have any compression bandages or even just a, a rash guard yeah top or bottom um and elevate if you need to otherwise than that it's gonna have to heal on its own time sure you can take those drugs but <sighs> drugs have side effects mm. read the side effects yeah um, i guess like inflammation is a more chronic thing instead of just like post injury inflammation yeah and there's other other things you'd be looking out for with inflammation because there's certain what we call inflammatory musculoskeletal problems you might have heard of called things called rheumatoid arthritis ankylosing spondylitis gout for example all these kind of things are where basically your immune system is messing you around essentially um and the the symptoms are different to what you call like a normal aching pain mm. so um instead of having pain on activity these people get pain on rest and they sure. want to move and they're worse very painful and stiff for the first hour or two in the morning and they might have multiple sites of pain um or we've got definitely across the buttocks and um then there's certain blood tests that can be done other investigations as well and then there's obviously it's a different case of management compared to i don't know sore elbow mm. or mechanical back pain let's say or a cartilage tear yeah and that's how they manage that differently um I think what we're going to come to in the future is more about nutrition. Yeah, I was going to say is that it's going to be, you know, I think a lot of the inflammation stuff, chronic inflammation stuff is going to be based on uh, nutrition and yeah. high sugar and stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's that's coming, but I feel that that's probably a few years off. Yeah. yeah. I don't think there's been enough interest from the medical profession to get it, you know, out of there, so to speak. They just want to sell more <laughs> anti-inflammatory pills. Uh, and then same guy asks um, CBD oil. Do you know any kind of... I've heard good things about it. Yeah. Um, it claims it, to be anti-inflammatory yeah. and stuff like that. If With all those things, sup with any kind of supplement or with any kind of um, cream or something that isn't a um, pharmacologically tested drug, so to speak, it's very or well, even including pharmacologicals it's very quite individual yeah if it works for you great yeah take it if you're happy with if there's no major side effects you're not happy to take it and you've read everything and you feel confident you want to make that decision fine mm. everyone's autonomous if it doesn't work don't keep taking it but, well you can keep taking it but it's obviously not doing a lot for you sure it's wasting money essentially so um if it apart from saying that it's not allowed to <laughs> yeah, try and work it out for yourself yeah essentially. um I think another one for finger injuries, keeping fingers in two more for finger injuries. Um, yeah, go, go guys, go watch the video I did on uh rice bucket training. It's, it's great for you. I'll uh, watch it as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's all right. Actually. Uh, well, if I say so myself, another one for CBD actually help. I'll tell you what guys, uh, the CBD stuff, like I, I got given some CBD oil from, um, can Ape, the company is. And, uh, I don't believe in necessarily believe in all of the stuff that it claims to be able to do. I don't believe that it's going to protect protect me from cancer and it's going to you know make me fly <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, do I believe that it's anti-inflammatory? Maybe you know I'm 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 open-minded on it. Personally, like I think it helps me sleep. Mm. Like I genuinely, uh, you know, very, very simply put, um, it doesn't taste very nice, but I'm still using it. Okay. So I must think that something's <laughs> going on there. Otherwise, I wouldn't use it anymore. So uh, if you have trouble sleeping, I know a lot of people have trouble sleeping after um, after uh, training sessions when they finish late and they go straight to bed afterwards. Try try some CBD oil and just see if it helps you get to sleep. And like you know, like you said before, you know, with most nutritional supplements, try it for yourself because some people it's going to work and some people it doesn't work. What about other people at the gym? Does it work for them? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Really, I don't. I don't know anyone else that I train with that uh, that, that that does the CBD or. But I've heard some people s swear by it. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I guess it's just find out. Any advice on the best exercises for strengthening mobility for rehabbing after a hip replacement? Ah, right. Um, so now, obviously, there's. If it depends who your surgeon is, some of them have precautions or what they do and don't want you doing for the first kind of six weeks afterwards. But a lot of places that's being scrapped anyway. Um, but if it's saying it's down the line, um, most hip replacements will regain pretty much 
near all their range of movement. There'll be some restrictions, but with knee replacements, you, you do well to get past a 90 degree bend. Um, for hip replacements, they can generally do quite well mm. with their movement afterwards. Um, Wait, for knee replacements, people can't get past 90 degrees? Yeah. A, really? Yeah, so oh, shit. that's what they aim for. If they're surgeon, That's what they aim for? Yeah, it's just zero to 90. Nine, past 90 is generally considered a bonus. What? So, uh, so like less than 90? No, no, sorry. As in, if you can, the, the goal is basically you need 90 to sit on the toilet. Yeah. If you can get that, the surgeon's happy. Yeah. Um, and if they so say. Zero being 180, being straight leg. Yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah, got you. Um, wow, that's really bad. So there's like, jiu jitsu would be out of the question pretty much. Often. Well, I see something, and they don't really like people kneeling on them either. Yeah. So um, that being said, I've seen people who have had knee replacements who can get a pretty much full bend wow. and can kneel. So it's not unheard of. And again, variety of reasons why that could be. For hips, um, from a, from a mo mobility perspective, um, so if we say flexion, you can do everything high step ups um, to force your hip to go up really high. Um, you could do a lunge with your foot on the a step behind you. If you do it lower down, it will increase your um, extension ability because mm. it has to eccentrically load the hip, hip flexors. Um, any hip abduction stuff, side lying against a band or a stick in the air um, or in machines at the gym, load it to the sideways um, rotations are fairly straightforward you can just sit on the edge of your bed and bend your knee and just swing your leg side to side while keeping your thigh down um, so essentially your foot's just moving side to side while your knee is bent at 90 degrees hip replacements like knee replacements generally do quite well um, sadly in the nhs what will usually happen is providing the patient can get back to a decent function of life and that's all they really get Mm. Unless they have higher levels and are really struggling to get there, they can they then might come see us. Yeah. But what usually happens is they'll have the surgery. Um, someone they might get a physio or a physio assistant come to their house once or twice afterwards just to make sure they're functioning and can do everything functionally okay, like walking and the stairs and stuff like and that. And then they're on their own, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And for most people, that's enough. But for know? someone doing jujitsu, they need a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, hip mobility is individual. I can't give out a specific prescription yeah. um, without seeing someone, but again, there's simple enough um, exercise you can do for hip flexion, ab extension, abduction. Yeah, I think I think you get some you get some good ones there. Um, next one: knees, ACL, MCL, meniscus. How they recover from tears? I think yeah. we co we covered a bit of that. Yeah, we um, essentially just loading it. Um, like keeping it, you know, like you said, keeping it moving and yeah. within, with, you know, ch challenging. All that, the if you are going to have surgery, basically the stronger and fitter you go in, the stronger and fitter you come out the other yeah. end. So like, very occasionally, although they're not doing it much now, we get referrals for ACL prehab. Sure. Uh, where someone's going to have it repaired, but they want to send them to us first to make nice. sure they are doing something yeah. about it. Doing it less so now um, because you're just giving them advice in advance. So this is what you need to do. But generally... If you're going to have surgery, have as, yes, okay, it might hurt a bit, but do what you can to get your leg as strong as possible because it'll make your recovery a lot easier. Mm. If you do have an ACL tear, your surgeon wants to basically have your knee as straight as soon as possible. Um, they get panicky when they can't, people struggle to extend their knee. I've mm. had some of those surgeries. The bend, there's some limitations on initially, but then that, that can gradually get there um, most of the time. Um, if you're not having surgery, then it would be a case of gradual loading and rehab. Um, through mix of strength and stability work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tennis, golfer's elbow, prevention, recovery. Right. Uh, I was hoping we'd get to this. Okay. Uh, so tennis and golfer's elbow. So uh, for those that don't know, tennis is um, on the outside of your elbow, so the lateral side, and that is on your lateral epicondyle of your humerus, which is your upper arm bone. Golf is on the reverse side, so inside. Uh, these two conditions generally come on without trauma. So most of the time yes. they'll cover the overuse injury bracket, so to speak. Yeah. And both of them are um, where the tendon, most of the time, where it connects your forearm muscles, which then run into your hand, as we said, and um, basically gets overloaded through a mixture of things as we've already covered. Because it's tendon, obviously white, white tissue is slow to heal. Um, loading of it. There's a variety things that have previously been suggested but there's runs simple things for tennis elbow exercise and people got video of this so they can even probably see this if i do this now you essentially uh, for tennis elbow um it's the extensors that have been irritated mm -hmm. uh, so you have it over the end bottle or something in your hand so it can even be unweighted to start with and you essentially just extend your wrist and then slowly lower 
down as slow as humanly possible because we know that tendons love eccentric loading. Mm -hmm. For the reverse, golfer's elbow, um, you basically bring it up, flex it, and then lower it down as slow as humanly possible. These things are slow, um, but premise key important thing is and um, don't let anyone inject a steroid in it because tendons do not do very well with steroids. And we found that when people um, have had steroid injections, that's led to less poor outcomes down the line. Yeah, I've heard that uh, cortisone steroid injections into the tendons actually weaken them. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Um, and otherwise, for prevention of those two issues, you then need to do some form of wrist strengthening. Yeah, you know, and, and, and one of the other questions on here, just a little bit uh, further down, because mm. I had a look earlier, it was... Um, this is never ending. Uh, yeah. It's a long list. <laughs> so I keep it going. It's, it's a fine. long list. It was, uh, does Dan Strauss get tendonitis in his elbows from his grip work? And the answer is, and this is a, this is a common question, I do a lot of grip work. I train grip like three or four times a week, mm -hmm. and that I like hard. Uh, that doesn't include all of the stuff I'm doing in grappling. And I've never, ever suffered from uh, medial or lateral epicondylitis at all. Um, and I believe that it's because I do the grip work, yeah. not in spite of me doing the grip work, that I haven't suffered from, from any uh, tendonitis in my mm. elbows. Because, uh, you know, I think uh, these injuries come from an imbalance in the uh, flexors and extensors. Because the problem that you have, I don't, I don't know if you, if if you believe the same from this, but when you're doing grappling, you're doing jujitsu, and you're just using your flexors all, uh, all the time, mm -hmm. grabbing onto the gi, and you're not training your extensors at the same time, you start to get uh, an imbalance in the forearm, and mm -hmm. then that causes the overuse and the stress is just, you know, the movement patterns are off there, but just because the muscles are tight in one area and not in the other area. Now, and you said about imbalances. Imbalances, if you'd have asked if these are even five years or even less than that two three years ago everyone would be like oh yeah it's definitely imbalances now there's other thing with imbalances that they can be yes in certain situations can be detrimental but for a lot of athletes they can be as a result of and it sure, can be yeah it can actually be necessary for them to benefit interesting and help them gains so um i will commonly experience see uh, certain judo athletes so if you are right-handed and you are uh, gripping lapel you will have hypertrophy of certain muscles that you will use to rotate your shoulder back or keep it elevated compared to of your left sleeve side which does this more yeah whatever you want to do with it um and your right if your right foot stance you have your right foot forwards and your muscles set up from that will be slightly different to your left expected because you do the sport now you said about the tennis and uh, golfer's elbow mm. if that you know, as a result of sport you've had those changes um in the we said about the loading if you have those changes fine but let's say um you suddenly have to do something outside of jiu-jitsu or your something your jiu-jitsu jiu -jitsu changes where you have to use your extensors more suddenly than they're used to doing then you're quite that imbalance because set them up to be more set to be hurt because they haven't got much strength and capacity there sure. that makes sense yeah um your flexors could be fine because they're used to doing it all the time and that they mm. can tolerate whatever you all this activity all day long because they've mm. got the capacity um, but if you suddenly have to do a lot more of extension work because you have to fight someone different or you're doing something else outside of jiu-jitsu um, that makes you have to use it more and that, like I said, ask it to do more it can tolerate, it can set it up to get hurt. We, we're coming away from the imbalances phrase. That's interesting. Because it, it implies that unless you're um, 100% side to side... But Even. it's not. But, but it's kind of not not uh, a left and right imbalance in this yeah. case. Yeah. But a side to side. Sort of an, uh, uh, antagonist either. muscle yeah. imbalance. You know, sort of your biceps overworked and your triceps not worked enough. Yeah. And that's causing some. Uh, you know, for for me personally, I don't get any tendonitis, and I believe it's because I use the grip in so many different ways, mm. and that I've strengthened that up. Yeah. That actually, uh, people are surprised. They assume that I get bad tendonitis doing the grip stuff, but I actually think that training more grip, if you're smart with it um you get kind of build the uh, even if it isn't an imbalance thing but you're strengthening the wrist at different angles that you're not used to strengthening and then that that can help help at the elbow as well absolutely yeah if that, that's, that's you didn't even need me to tell me your advice you gave the advice for <laughs> <laughs> um what we got what we got we, we got i skipped some 
A lot of them are the same. Uh, spine health. We kind of went over that. Did we yeah, go over that a little spine bit? Health. We covered in all the kind of things yeah. you said at the beginning. Yeah, knees, knees. Sam Cook says, "What's wrong with my leg?" <laughs> she hurt her knee. Um, hamstring injury rehab. Did we talk about that? No, because it's not often. It's not a common injury in uh, sure. grappling. Um, <laughs> I remember leading reading uh, online. Um, top five most common martial arts injuries, and some they put hamstring injury in there, and I've yet to really see a hamstring injury. In yeah, it's not common. It's not common at all. You get it in sprinters and yeah. sp- football and rugby and stuff like that. Not, you know, you need to be doing a running sport. Yeah. The last time I checked, jujitsu and judo didn't involve much running. No. Um, but what to do is essentially like for all the other things, you just load it and work it as much as tolerable. And yeah. Go from there. Yeah. Uh, meniscus strengthening. We've kind of spoken about. You can meniscus tell. strengthening. Um, <laughs> you, I will say you, you can't strengthen a meniscus. No, but stuff around it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, training with broken ribs. Ooh. Broken ribs is an interesting one because it's like piss all you can do about it. And p- yeah. You can't even work it through a range, really. No, it's done. And to be honest with you, unless there's a problem with the lung or the major problem with the rib, I mean, medically, not a lot anyone would do about no. it either. No. It's just happened and it will heal slowly. Um, bone healing takes about three months. Wow. Um, and it might be quicker on soon. It depends on what kind of fracture you've had. Yeah. But uh, there's really not a lot you can do aside from saying just exercise as tolerable. Um, I wouldn't obviously expect you, if you've had a fracture, I wouldn't ex- really expect to um, have major pressure going through your rib cage for mm. f- six, eight weeks. Sure. Do other things. Yeah. Um, but it's really probably not the best idea. Um, Levi, uh, post grip training, gi training for fingers and how they're getting the hurt less. Uh, I'll, I've got an answer for one of these, which is uh, Play-Doh in the fridge. Mm. Play-Doh in the fridge is great. Get it out after you come back from training and, and move it around in your hands a little bit and you just get that inflammation down. It feels nice. Uh, strategies for the older grappler seeking to maximize longevity. Kind of covered them already, I think. In yeah, all I, those think so. I think areas. so. Um, uh, being, being mature doesn't make any difference. Um, just train smart. I think like all of the, the basic principles that you yeah. said probably are even more important when you start to get older, yeah. actually. And, you know, you will have some... The thing we say about the uh, changes on scans and x-rays, um, grey hairs and wrinkles don't hurt. Sure. There's a natural part of life. Yeah. X-ray findings and MRI are then the same thing. Mm. You know, okay, yes, you can have traumatic incidences. Let's say you tear your patella tendon mm. or uh, or your let's say slap tear. Mm. Okay, makes sense. But in lieu of any major trauma, um, those findings are. You know, I could X-ray everyone around London who's over sixty tomorrow and find signs some form of knee arthritis in pretty much all of them. Yeah, at varying degrees. Some people could have horrendous looking knees and be absolutely fine. Others could have hardly anything and be in severe pain. Sure. Um, so it's you know everything as we said before. Uh, best way to keep your psoas from getting too tight. So we said about stretching, um, but one of the things we already mentioned. If you're at the gym or even just even before training, the eccentric um, working of it. So you basically do a lunge with your foot on a step mm-hmm. or something behind you and basically just slowly lower mm. uh, into the lunge. And that will essentially work your um, hip flexors, so as being one of them. Um, and that's the best way of, I can advise of keeping it flexible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, lower back pain. I like that's not it. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the it. most vague question ever. Just lower back pain. <sighs> So we said about scans already and we've kind of covered that and we said about pain and all that kind of goes with it. And with all like with all other injuries, with low back pain, you load it as is tolerable and you challenge the system, so to speak. You have to take pain relief if you need to. Um, you stay positive. Mm. I say to a lot of people um, on our phone service, if you can stay active and positive, you'll get better. Sure. People, where people go wrong as if they sit around at home all day, panic about it and don't move. Mm. You can get out of that mindset and get into the I'm gonna this will get better. I just need to work on it as able. But be gent like be gentle. Gentle. With it, yeah. Expect some pain. Pain's to be pain is a natural body response. Um and it is useful. Just challenge the system a bit of ache, throb, fine. Just nothing serious of up severe or sharp where you feel like your back's, you know, in severe agony mm. essentially. Um with low back pain on its own, um, as far as I know, unless there's any obvious sinister pathology going on, uh, or unless it turns into any um, progressive neurological changes, they won't operate. 
Yeah. They just leave it because the surgery is no better with or without sure. on its own for lower back pain. Yeah, you know, I, I, I've, I've had lower back pain myself. I have it like... Um, I was originally diagnosed with a pars fracture. Okay. Um, and then uh, bulging discs uh, above and below the vertebrae that the pars fracture was on. Mm. And the first back specialist that I tr that I saw wanted to um, do a put a pin to heal the the fracture, mm. um, but then said it was like be a one in ten chance that it wouldn't take, and if it didn't, yeah. you'd have to fuse the spine, and then that would fuck me up for life. <laughs> uh, so I said no. And then I saw another back specialist who said. Uh, he, they did like a biological acti like a biologically active test to mm. see whether like inject the dye in and yeah. then do an MRI and see whether the dye went to, you know, basically the dye goes where the inflammation is, see whether it goes to the, 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 the pars fracture in the, in the vertebrae and it didn't. Okay. So even though, and it's, I guess, an ex one of the examples of um, what you were saying, which is you can get a scan. So I get a scan that says that my back's broken mm. but actually that's probably not causing any of the symptoms of my back pain mm -hmm. i do have symptoms of back pain but it's not causing them um you know stuff that i've done is uh you know so, so again just challenging it a little bit like you said you know um for, for I, I had this injury about six years ago mm. um and there's still stuff that i won't do you know like i don't do any deadlift i don't try not to pick anything off the floor but for a really long time i couldn't walk for longer than maybe 15 minutes without it basically season up and then mm -hmm. be a couple of weeks to make it go again um and then i got a dog and i was walking my dog every day and within six months i was now able to walk for hours at a time mm -hmm. uh and like you know that's an example of challenging it gently and then yeah. being able to get back to ranges that you didn't think possible but on that subject i wanted to ask what your uh, opinion on sort of traction in joints and the spine in 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 particular sort of stretching it out with either mm -hmm. with inversion boots or just from sort of uh, dead hanging from from a bar and stuff like that in terms of recovery for the back injuries like i said uh with the supplements i'll say the same thing if someone feels that doing something like that helps mm. why not you know i feel like that's your response if you don't think it's uh <laughs> you don't think it's legit but you're like yeah you well, go for it and if it works for you you do it it's, it's basically like taking a paracetamol sure it'll feel nice at the time it yeah. won't make any lifelong major changes yeah it'll just feel nice and if that helps great it's just like scratching an itch sure or putting some ice on it it's the same principle um it's not gonna speed up your recovery anymore or it's not gonna um you know take your pain away completely mm. Um, but it will, if that makes you feel nice and that, you know, you've done something that irritates it and you go and do that or something else that makes you feel great. Fine. Um, I wouldn't, if someone, if you're going to see a healthcare professional and they're just doing that for you for, uh, 30 minutes and charging you 45 quid and you're going twice a week for six weeks, it's not making any difference. You're probably getting not much value for your money. Yeah. But in the short term, if someone wants to do it just to, you know, make it feel a bit nice after done some hard rolling, why not? Sure. You know, it's, to, it's providing that, you know, if they're, ha they're not hanging upside down for too long, so they're going to detriment their blood pressure yeah. or anything else. Um, yeah, I guess it's the best answer I can That's give. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, lower back and hip exercises. We've kind of spoken about that. Mm. And then finally, strapping. Many players just strap up and carry on. What strapping does he think, what do you think, what strapping does he think, he being you, yeah. what strapping does he think is worth learning and should we strap to prevent injury or just support weak joints slash injuries? So, to so I guess there's two types of strapping. You get the um, stuff that we see in, in, in grappling a lot, which is the fingers and wrists yep. um, and then, and, and toes and ankles sometimes. Uh, and then you have sort of like, kinesiology tape where <laughs> like the crossfitters love it where yeah. you've got fucking weird shit coming all around yeah. so what's your take on that stuff so um let's start with the uh the normal strapping as you said about um if someone let's take, take an ankle sprain as an example if someone sprains an ankle it's not they can still do their sport but they just want some support um and they feel better about it fine for the short term of a week or so if it's necessary use it mm. um in the long term, it's not going to prevent anything. Yeah, it's not going to prevent you getting hurt. If anything, actually, it's going to keep your focus on it. It's going to reduce the amount of movement you have. It might it might increase it? Yeah, um, I was going to say. If, you know, one part of the question was, uh, should you strap to prevent injury? That sounds 
that sounds ludicrous no, i wouldn't do that no. because also then you're not building the muscles around it Correct. because you you're, you're not you're not challenging yeah. the joint are you and more importantly you're emphasizing that it's still hurt yeah you know you're telling your system i still need to protect this yeah which can again play around with your pain system um in regards to the k-tape um k-tape <laughs> has got a variety of opinions about it most negative mm. um and i again use that as a short term if this helps and allows you to get through your whatever fine use it it is not a long-term solution and it will not people talk about strength gains from it and support it most evidence says it doesn't affect your strength at all sure or ability to do things there's a few papers out there that do but if you look at majority they'll say no in the long term like i said it won't massively affect your um uh, long-term um, problem but in the short term if you if someone finds that wearing some k-tape just like doing the thing hanging for their back or some ice or heat or whatever and they find that it allows them to get through that session a bit better for that week or so why not you know it's not going to have any major side effects if it allows them to do more with it and get back to the sport i'm not going to stand i'm not going to say no you can't have any tape mm. um it is not um displacing anything or it's not adjusting anything it's not causing any physiological change except at the skin um, where it's just giving that implementation. Um, but if it allows them to do it, why not? From yeah. the K-tape perspective. Um, for the strapping, it's kind of the same thing. Really. Yeah. If it allows you to do it, fine. But in the long term, I, I don't you don't need, I wouldn't advise any athlete to be long term strapping or taping it yeah. because you underlying need to load and challenge that tissue. Sure. Because it's just enforcing that you're still hurt. Maybe for the fingers because you fuck them up and then yeah. they're just gone for life. Yeah. You're invest in a, <laughs> invest in some, I know people who, <laughs> get through absolutely tons of tape but yeah. I, I don't use it pretty much ever no mm. it's um but for the mate for the otherwise for the joints yeah, if you need it do otherwise if you feel you can manage without if you can wear a brace for your ankles mm. sometimes the elbows um which can be a bit more supportive but again what's better is often patient specific sure. and often it's not brand specific sometimes some just one brand works better for another person it just feels more comfortable compared to another one they just mm. prefer the color who knows mm. um if it allows you to get through it great but in the long term i wouldn't want any athlete training with regular tape or um strap over a specific major joint yeah cool that's all the questions that's all the questions and we've done two hours and 20 minutes how do you feel uh <laughs> i feel pain everywhere <laughs> i feel right man uh so uh anything that you wanted to add to that I think we cover quite a lot. Yeah, I think we cover quite I a lot. I think uh, if people have any questions, we can always answer them again at a later time. Absolutely. Uh, and if people want to... F so you're doing some work with the UK BJ, yep. which is cool to see that they're getting on board with someone and kind of thinking about looking after the fighters in that way. Yeah. So where is that uh, directly on the UK BJ website? Or? So everyone gets the newsletter. I think every so... If you're a member, you get a newsletter. And all the... There is... At the moment, it's only for the members. But... I have a suspicion that over this sometime this year the videos can be released to everyone. Okay. Um, I'd be surprised if that doesn't happen. The plan okay. is for it all to go out. Sure. Um, so it will become available over time. The website is simply the judophysio.com. Yeah. One word. That's for you. That's for me. Uh, as is the Twitter and the Instagram. So and all the contacts are on there. I'm fairly easy to find. Okay, and I'll put all the links in in the yeah. description for this episode um, as well. And there may be some other stuff coming out down the line with judo and other things as well. Yeah, sweet. Right, let's wait and see. Cool. Ben, thank you very much for, for <laughs> very much for coming and uh, sharing your wisdom with us. Thank and, you for uh, having me. Hopefully making, you know, just I'm trying to not worry about my things. <laughs> so hopefully making them go away. But cheers. Thank you very much. For thank coming. you. Cheers. Cool, guys. That's it. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I hope that some of you found it useful uh, and some stuff to think about for the future. Uh, if you want to find out more about Ben, then you can go to his website, which is thejudophysio.com. Uh, as always, you can contact the podcast at uh, podcast at raspberryape.com. You can go on my website, which is raspberryape.com, buy some cool merchandise. Why not? Uh, my Instagram is raspberry underscore eight. My Twitter is also raspberry underscore eight, which I don't use quite as much. Um, that's it. If you enjoy this episode, if you found it useful, go rate it highly on itunes and share it with your friends you know give it to your buddies who are injured and maybe it can help them as well uh i hope you enjoyed it and i'll catch you guys next time take it easy